The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Saturdays or Sundays, SOR Media, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of this broadcast or podcast without the expressed written consent of SOR Media is strictly prohibited. Listener discretion is advised. Are you experienced? Then come own the night with us. Brother has taken control, shoveling dirt in every hole. Predators to condemn your soul, watching you and watching me. We're all Station atop the mountains of British Columbia, live from SOR headquarters. This is Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. Like nothing's wrong Soon you will be long You can follow us on our website spacedoutradio.com and on Spaced Out Radio on iTunes You can follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and on Instagram at Dave Scott S-O-R on Facebook at Spaced Out Radio Show and on our YouTube channel, Spaced Out Radio. Brother wants to make headlines, be immortalized. Everyone's got an electric eye with the digital spies. Buckle up, space travelers. It's time to go for a ride on Spaced Out Radio with host Dave Scott. I know you're out there. It's to- Monday, September 24th, Tuesday, September 25th, if you're on the East Coast or across the pond. And this, my friends, is Spaced Out Radio. Hope you had a great day and night. I am your host, Dave Scott, broadcasting to you live from the Great White North, on top of the mountains of central British Columbia, right here at SOR headquarters. We are 150,000 strong nightly on the SOR radio network at Deep Talk Radio, and we say hello to each and every one of you you want to look at our archives, they are free on our YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. Our website is spacedoutradio.com where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to Bumblefoot, shop at our store, read up on the encounter online, and so much more. Don't forget, this weekend, the first annual Caribou Paracon, presented by Spaced Out Radio and the Canadian Society of Questers. It is going to be a great weekend come join us in the caribou questers.ca is where you go to get tickets questers.ca click on the fall conference you're going to love next weekend tonight's show is brought to you by the youtube channel in suho sebastian martin brings high quality messages to the masses go to spacedoutradio.com click on the in suho banner and subscribe to the channel today It's the final Monday of the month, which means we get paid a visit by the man who hates the term cryptozoologist. Yes, Butch Witkowski from UFO Cop is back. Butch is a former police officer out of the state of Pennsylvania who spends his retired years running around the forest looking for things that howl in the night. Even though Butch hasn't had a face-to-face encounter with Bigfoot or Dogman, I'm still not sure who would flinch first. You know, Butch can be quite an ornery fellow. 
As we do with this feature we call Strange Days, we will have Butch come in, give us the law of the land when it comes to investigating cryptids and some of the weird cases he's been working on and following. Then at the bottom of hour number three, we get to the news with the encounter and Everett Themer. Mr. Butch Witkowski, sorry about the snafu on the start there, but the big thing is... We are rocking and rolling back with you, my friend. How you been? I'm fine. <laughs> yeah, it was getting a little hair, hairy there for a while, wasn't it? <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, you, you can only do so much before you have to just hit refresh. And yeah, well, you love technology, you know. Yeah, I was working on my computer earlier today, and and uh, and it was just, I guess, uh, just needed a reboot. Sometimes that happens. Usually I don't fire up this computer until, until, you know, r- right before I get into the studio. But lesson learned. Stafu, lesson learned. You know how it goes. Look, that's the good part. You didn't have to call tech services in India. Well, no, no. But, you know, the main thing is my, my techie person, you know, I don't like calling her at night because... You know, she's probably sitting in her pajamas that have the feet on them. And, you know, she's all cozied up because she's on the East Coast trying to sleep. The last thing she needs to do is hear from old Davey here saying, help me, help me now. But I will tell you this, and I just want to give a qu- quick shout out to Eric Cooper, Corey Rees, Izzy Cooper, and the team of Forest Moon Paranormal for putting on one hell of a good Paracon this weekend down in Cedro Woolley, Washington State. I got to speak at the event for the third straight year. It was absolutely fantastic. You know, I got to tell you, I absolutely love Paracons, my friend. I love Paracons. They are so much fun. I love meeting people. And, and I'm pretty sure you're probably the same way. Yeah, yeah, I do. I like them. Do you like the uh, attention that it brings? Uh, I don't really notice that much. It's uh, We used to have a very large one down in Gettysburg. They haven't had it for the last couple of years, and I don't know why. I mean, they they had a, a large one up around Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, too, and that was very large. Uh, that, was a, that was a three-day affair at, uh, at the casino there, and, uh, and that place was packed. They had, like... Phew, Tons of people, lots of speakers, but um, they didn't do that last year either. I, I don't know if it's um, the prices of these Paracons are getting out of line or, you know, people just, I, I, sometimes I think people just get tired of hearing the same speakers. You know, I, I mean, I've been to a lot of UFO conferences and I've listened to the same speakers, you know, 10, 15 times telling the same stories. So, you know guess it could get a little boring. Well, you always got to be interesting, and you always have to try and, and uh, you know, change up the topic a little bit. Because if you keep speaking about the same thing at every conference, people will eventually get bored. And that's what you don't want. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know, if I hear one more person tell me all about Roswell, I'm going to choke. Um. I think the guys that it's it seems to be um, the younger, more upcoming uh, investigators. And I'm going to say, not the old dudes like myself, but uh, the, the guys that are you know been at it now for maybe ten years or so that are bringing up to date stuff, new stuff. Um, they're the ones that are really interesting. Uh, I mean, the old guys are interesting, but you know, like I said, you can only listen to the Roswell story so many times, and you start to get cross eyed. Well, it's funny that you mentioned Roswell, because I actually mentioned that in my speech about how you get all these people out there who are, are talking about Roswell. Roswell, everybody wants to do something on Roswell. They all think they got something new. And yet 90% of the reports out there never mention the second crash at San Augustine, ever. Yeah. The Aztec crash, I think, is much more interesting than Roswell. Oh, there's a bunch of different, uh, there's a bunch of different uh, really cool crashes uh, that you have to go through. But I mean, you know, when you when you kind of go through it, Butch, you know, it's just amazing how everybody just recycles the same information, and just because it's been out of the news for 
you know, 15, 20 years that, you know, it's not the same situation where what's old is new again. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, and it's the same thing with books. I mean, um, some of the books that have been written on Roswell, uh, it, you know, if you, if you pick up one book and look at another book and look at another book, they change the wording, but it's the same story. I mean, they don't really bring anything new to the table. It's just uh, kind of a rehash of really early, early on reports. And, you know, I don't know. I get bored quick with that stuff. I, I'd rather read uh, stuff that's more updated or, uh, or somebody's a different t- somebody with a different take on what they're doing or how they're doing it or equipment they're using or, or how they're going about uh, carrying on their investigation. But... They're few and far between. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you go to these paracons, what's 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 something that you want to see as not only a researcher but as a spectator as well? Um, I I I like to see um, out of the box thinking. Uh, out of the box presentations, uh, you know. If, you, if I see if I see one more PowerPoint on ufology, I'm going to kill myself uh, because it's all the same stuff. So you know, then you have the a couple of the folks that come out there and they'll bring forth a case that you know, like you never heard of, and then they'll start going on that. And you know, it won't be a PowerPoint so much as it'll be you know direct audience contact. And I like that a lot. I, I like roundtables. I like um, uh, audience participation a lot. I know some researchers go up there. They, you know, they rehearse their gig. They go up there. They do their PowerPoint and off the stage. I, hey, I'm happy to go up on that stage and you know stand there for whatever it takes to answer questions. I, I just, I just like that a lot more. Roundtables really intrigue me. We've had, we've had a couple that we put on ourselves, and they worked out really great. And you know, you, you get such a plethora of different questions. That you know, uh, there's no way you could study for it. It just doesn't work out that way. But uh, you know, people come up with some really good stuff, and you don't really hear that at uh, organized um, conventions or or the conferences. It's no. usually, yeah, it's all pre org You know, it's orchestrated. It's it, it follows a uh, a template, and that's the way it is. It doesn't change. Uh, with roundtables where you just, you know, you and maybe a couple of the researchers sitting amongst or in front of or in between or around, uh, you know, 50 or 60 people shooting off questions, it, re- it really works. It really does. And you get a lot out of it. I mean, I do. I mean, the people that I've done it with, they got a lot too. And I think the audience participation and, you know, you're answering their questions directly, you know. And uh, they don't have to sit there and watch you with a pointer sticking it up at a at a screen, going like, "That's a UFO, that's Bigfoot." You know, it just gets crazy. But I, I really like the the audience participation part. Me too. Me too. And you know, it, it's something I love being able to answer questions from people who just come up and want to talk. It's a little. Mm-hmm. It's still a little weird for me. I got to tell you, it's still a little weird for me because, you know, I'm not used to talking to people face to face. I'm used to talking to them over a microphone. So when somebody comes up to me and is like wanting to hear me, my stories or how I got into this or wants to tell me their own story or something along those lines or gain more information, I never know how long I'm supposed to spend with that person. So sometimes I I accidentally abruptly just say, oh, I I, I gotta go, I I gotta I gotta move on to the next person here or, or whatever, because you know it's it's a little bit too humbling, you know what I'm saying? That somebody actually wants your attention. Does yeah, that make sense? Yeah. Your opinion. <laughs> That's the one that always kills me. Uh, where you know somebody else will be like, well, what do you think of this or what do you think of that? And I and you know if I've never heard of it, I'll just go like, oh, I'm, I have no idea what you're talking about. So if you can enlighten me, maybe I can come up with some kind of answer. But uh, the people in the audience are a lot smarter than guys give them credit for. I you know um, uh, the Kansas uh, conference that I went to, which was a large, very large venue, and 
all the who's who of ufology was there, you know. I mean, just you name them, they were there. And um, uh, they all talked about ufology, and they talked about this, that, and the other thing. And I talked about human mutilations. And uh, um, I had more, I, after I was all done, I think we, we spent an hour, an hour and a half on the stage. Then I went outside for a coffee and uh, smoked. And uh, I, I could, that half the crowd followed me outside. So I was like giving another conference outside the building at this huge theater. And uh, I, really neat people. Uh, it, it's, folks are really cool when they know what they're talking about. You know what I mean? They read something, they saw something, and they want your opinion. Uh, you know, like, uh, Butch, what do you think of this? Or, Butch, is this a hoax? Or, have you ever heard of this? Or, you know, and it keeps you on your toes. And that's why I always tell researchers, you know, that, you know, they want to know how to do this or do that. I'm just like, you really need to keep up on this stuff. I, I, no matter, I mean, if it's in the news or it's something that, uh, somebody sent you, or if you have a um, uh, some kind of database that you can keep up to date with, uh, I stay away from YouTube. Um, that just makes me crazy. Um, but I, I, I think the more you participate directly with the folks out there, uh, the better off they are from listening. Yeah. I'm getting nonsense, and you're getting an education because. You know, and I've been stumped. I've had people ask me questions where I'm just like up there scratching my head, going like, uh, "We need to talk later." But you really got me in a barrel. I said, "I have no idea what you're talking about." And um, but I just really enjoy that type of a type of conference or round table or white table, whatever you want to call them. Mm -hmm. And you know, sometimes talking to those people is where you get some of the best information. Mm -hmm. because they oh, don't know where they don't know where to share it to oh absolutely absolutely um i've gotten some really great stuff uh um from people from conferences i've had people um you know ask me a question about a case and i you know i i never heard of the case i don't know anything about it i, I mean i know of the area but i don't know if the case might not be in the state and, you know, they'll ask for my address or something like that. And a couple of days later, I'll get like a white paper or a book or, or a video or something in the mail. And, you know, and I keep back, I get right back to them because, you know, they were looking for an answer and I didn't have an answer, but they put me in the right direction to find an answer. And then I can get back to them and give them kind of an answer. Um, good, bad, or indifferent. You can't neglect or ignore these folks. And I see it a lot at conferences where, some of the bigger named uh, folks in ufology and cryptozoology and the paranormal, they just blow people off, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, they get that um, celebrity bite in the butt, and all of a sudden, you know, they think they're uh, up on a pedestal and they're going to get an Emmy after the show. It doesn't work out that way. But um, I, I'd... I I'm more than happy to just sit out in the crowd and talk to people out there. I don't have to be up on any stage. I do got to ask you though, and I want to get to this because I think this is kind of important. You know, when I go to the conferences, you don't see a lot of young people. Sure you see people who are tagging along with their children, but that 20s to 30s crowd, even late teens crowd, late teens to early 30s, let's just make it a big gap. Okay, there doesn't seem to be a lot of people in that age category going to these conferences, Butch. Maybe it's just the ones I have been to, and the people who are of that age are already investigating the paranormal or Bigfoot or UFOs, whatever it may be. But sitting in the stands, it's very difficult to look into his stands and see someone in that age category. It's maybe less than 5 to 10%. That's true. I mean, um, pretty much every conference I've ever attended, when you look out over the crowd, uh, you're looking at people between 40 and 70. Um, very few, more at the paranormal will you see younger, um, younger folks, but ufology and cryptozoology and anything else other than the paranormal, you're not going to see a lot of young at all. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 
Mm-hmm. What are those reasons? Well, the reasons, uh, the main reasons are nobody wants to teach them anything. Um, they have, um, they'll go to their local group, and of course they're not going to let them in because it's, you know, the, the group is uh, usually a husband and wife and a brother-in-law and a sister-in-law and a cousin and an uncle, and that's where it stays. I mean, they don't bring any new people into the group. And if they do bring newer people into the group, you know, they're they're kind of like the roadies, you know, like go unload the truck or go set up the equipment and then sit there and shut up and don't do anything. Uh, they're just there's they're not welcomed uh, into anything. I've seen that in ufology uh, a lot, and um, you have uh, younger folks out there uh, that they just want to learn. And uh, I always tell them, look, you know, you want to learn something or you got a question or you need to uh, see how and follow up on some kind of research, you know, just give me a yell, send me an email. I'll put you on the right track. Um, I've had a lot of folks in. I have had a lot of folks uh, do that. Um, uh, there's a young fellow outside of Philadelphia, um, maybe 20 miles outside of Philadelphia toward me where I'm at now. And um, he contacted me, oh, God, four or five years ago. He said he, just didn't, know, he didn't know how to do anything. He just he wanted, he wanted to get involved. He wanted to know what kind of equipment. I said, well, don't buy any equipment if you don't know what you're doing. So um, I told him, to, to gave him a couple uh, ideas on uh, books to read and uh, follow up on certain cases. And um, uh, I sent him a... Uh, a white paper that I did years ago on investigative techniques, and and now he's, he's got a four-man team out there, and he's getting some pretty good stuff. And um, but that's what you got to do. You've got to you've got to help. I mean, you can't just blow them off. And I see that so much where you know younger folks uh, want to get involved in the paranormal or ufology, ufology or or crypto stuff and. And the only thing they come to you with when they come to you is like, well, I saw this on YouTube or I saw this on on the TV, and this is how they do it. I'm going like, no, that's not how they do it. <laughs> I said, because if we're out in the field and it starts to rain, I'm not going to tell, turn around and look at you and say, cut. <laughs> you know, okay, it's going to stop raining now. And it's it's hard because some of these folks, They've been blown off so many times that, that it's not worth it to them anymore to get hassled. And I, I think we've lost a lot of good investigators like that. Although, like, uh, i got to say this, I've seen uh, more uh, and younger investigators coming up in ufology than anything else. Um, the shows on Bigfoot, like uh, Monster Hunters or Shooting Bigfoot or whatever the hell they are, um, they pretty much blew off a lot of people as far as being investigators. But ufology, there's still an interest there, younger interest. And what I what I always saw right away was these kids are smart. They know how to use technology. They know what they're talking about. You know, they know how to use a star map, which I would say. Pretty much 90% of the people that look at do ufology have no idea what to do with a star map, but uh, it's it's uh, it's coming it's that's it's coming along. It's not where it should be, especially in the in the crypto area and the um, paranormal end. Because right away, when you get younger people involved in the paranormal, first thing you want to look at is demons, witches, you know, all that all that crazy stuff, but. It's it's just the way it is. I mean, you know, uh, if you if you treat the folks right and you you put them on the right path, you know, you'll 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 make an investigator for life. If you blow them off or give them a bunch of garbage, you know, they'll just like eh, you're done. Do you think that the reason why the younger crowd maybe has kind of taken a step back is because of the fact that? there really is a a downflow right now in television programming. Whereas if you go back just three, four years ago, when I started Spaced Out Radio, it amazed me how many ghost hunter teams and paranormal teams and Bigfoot teams were all doing 
promos for television pilots and and they wanted to get their name out there and everybody had a pilot and the contract was signed you know what i'm saying like it was all over the place and Mm -hmm. knowing that you know 98 percent of them didn't get picked up one way or another do you think that that result really has caused a downplay in interaction because people just can't go out there and get their 15 minutes of fame like they thought. Well, <laughs> I think what people saw right away is when they tried it, you know, they didn't know what the giggle factor was. And, you know, they thought by knocking on the door and saying, hey, I'm a ghost hunter, or, hey, I'm a ufologist, or hey, I'm a this, I'm a that, that they were going to get instantly brought into the fold, you know, that this was this was going to be the moment. Uh, their lifetime achievement. Now they're an investigator. They haven't done anything yet, but now they're an investigator. And um, the letdown, I think, just is too much for a lot of folks. Um, if you are going to, you know, walk the walk and talk the talk, you better be doing it right, because people aren't dumb. I mean, you know, I, um, I, I've watched and I, I, I've watched and read about investigators that. You know, they especially in the paranormal field where they're going to come and cleanse your house as soon as you send them a check for five hundred bucks. Um, it's um, it's difficult to bring people into the fold um, because younger people, unlike us old guys that are retired, we can do this and spend a lot of time on it. A lot of these people, you know, have jobs, they work, uh, they have young families, uh, they go to school, uh, so they have a lot of things going against them, and uh, and I always warn them of that, you know, don't bite off a lot more than you can chew, uh, and if you're going to do that, then you, you need to get involved with a group or find yourself a couple of investigators that will help you out, you know, doing the things that you can't do and maybe showing you some shortcuts and cut your time down where you're not out there, you know, beat the bush for nothing. And uh, that works out a lot. Um, but, again, I, I'd really like to see a whole lot more of uh, younger researchers getting involved. But What about like attitude, said, though? What about attitude, uh, Butch? Because I know in the times where I have had, you know, younger investigators on this show, you can tell mm-hmm. there's a little bit of ego and a chip on their shoulder that they're oh, right sure. and everybody else is wrong. Of course, but they're trying to make a name for themselves. True. You know what I mean? Yeah. They're 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 trying they're trying to push their their persona on everybody else, even though they don't have one yet. They haven't done anything yet. Um, if you ask them, the last time they were in the field, they change the subject instantly because the only field work they do is on a computer. And um, I always say, uh, you know, you know the, f- the few that I've met over the years that I bumped into while I was out somewhere, whether it was on a star watch or a case or in the woods, I can count on one hand. And I've been doing this for 30 years now. So I guess it's... They had uh, the thing. The thing that I think really ruined them, or ruined a lot of investigators, was TV, because TV took them to radio, took them to conferences, took them here, took them there. So they spend all their time watching TV, going to conferences, and and uh, just making themselves a big deal when they're not doing anything. And there's a lot of those in the field. Uh, there's a couple that just set me right on fire just looking at them because I know they're not doing anything and I'm standing there watching them tell people what to do, how to do it, and why they should do it and why they shouldn't do it. And I'm thinking, like, eh, you couldn't find your butt with both hands in a heartbeat. And uh, But they're there and, you know, people buy it. No, and I can I can see that, and I can appreciate that. But the younger generation too, being more computer literate than even our generations can be here. This is where we're also getting a lot of CGI, a lot of Mm -hmm. photoshopping going on because everybody wants that money shot or that money video. Mm -hmm. But 
don't realize the folks with their CGI and, and their Photoshop is there's butts like me out there and a lot of other guys that we have Photoshop and we have CGI and we can take their fake photo apart in a matter of minutes. And um, I used to get a lot of pictures when I first started, you know, really getting into photogra- uh, looking at photographs and stuff for folks. And I will tell you this, <laughs> you only got to catch them one time. You never hear from them again. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but that's what I mean about the computer savvy ones, that uh, they not only want to be in the field, but they want to know how to use that computer to benefit their investigation. What that computer can do for them, whether it's looking in databases or looking up old cases or trying to find uh, topo maps of a certain area they're working in, or um, is their research area uh, have any history of a lot of uh, UFO sightings or Bigfoot sightings or whatever. And, and when people start talking about stuff like that, it is the mark of a good researcher because they're not using it to make up a story. They're using that technology to help them figure out what they're looking for or to give them a historical background on cases or to um, look up new types of technology that they may want to try. So uh, it's like the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know. Uh, But there are some good ones out there, Dave. There really are, and there's some really bad ones out there. There really are. Um, You know, I I just, I don't have a lot of uh, faith in somebody that started, you know, doing investigations last Monday and he's on a radio show tonight somewhere in the United States telling you everything he's found and done since last Monday. And uh, that just cracks me up. Or they steal somebody else's work. You know, they'll take somebody else's research or um, locations or photographs and they'll make it um, their research deal. And they usually get caught at that too. What's the biggest flaw or misconception that this younger generation has with investigating a subject like cryptids, Bigfoot or Dogman? Mm, I would say that um, a lot of um, bad vibes came from TV where you got, what's the guy's name, Bobo, running out nailing pork chops to trees, throwing out donuts and bacon, uh, running through the woods screaming in the middle of the night, uh, using all the camera, all this updated camera uh, technology. I was told a long time ago by a Bigfoot researcher, a long time ago, he says, you want to find Bigfoot? Go to the spot where he's been seen a lot and sit your ass down and watch. He says, we don't do tree knocks. We don't beat on anything. We don't do this. We don't take, we sit and watch. Just make sure your camera's ready to go. I'm going like, wow. (laughs) And he's pretty much right. Because, you know, if your research area encompasses, like, say, 6,000 acres of of state game lands or or federal federal game lands or federal woodlands, where would you start? Where would you even start? If you had had on one side of the 6,000 acre, you had a report, a sighting report, and on the other side of that 6,000 acres, you had another sighting report. So where are you going to start? It's surely not going to be waiting for you in either one of those. So I had one guy say, well, why don't you just go around that 6,000 acres and scatter meat? I said, well, because I'm not a millionaire. I said, even if I threw one hamburger out every you know square foot, I'd probably be broke. And you know they, they just get these goofy ideas of how to do things from the television. Uh, I mean, uh, I can't even remember the name of that ghost show that was on where uh, they got caught so many times faking stuff. I mean, they actually got caught at it. And uh, it's it's troubling, you know, uh, an honest investigation. So that means that you're going to go out. You're probably not going to find anything. You're going to have the best equipment. You probably spent your last dollar on something you really didn't need, but you wanted it. Uh, it's going to be cold. It's going to be wet. It's going to be rainy. It'll be hot. It'll be humid. You're going to go. Th- it'll be snowing. <laughs> you're going to go through all that and not get anything. But if you walk away smiling, 
you're doing it right. You walk bitching and carrying on for three or four weeks, get out of it. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. And people got to realize that every time you go out, you don't find what you're looking for. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes. Well, I think, not of, I think a lot of people, too, Butch, have to realize that you, if you're going, let's say, on a Sasquatch hunt or something along those lines, you, you just can't go out for an hour. You have to make it a full day, maybe even oh, a yeah. full day and night in order to see something. Because, because you might not be having action in the daytime doesn't mean that it's not going to pick up in the evening or nighttime. Yeah, well, when we go out, we go out for days. I mean... Uh, now a night, a, a star watch, I mean, I'll do that for one night, you know, but that's just, uh, see if anything's going on here, there other in different areas, um, where there's been recent reports or something like that. Uh, but when we go out on a, uh, on an expedition or, you know, we're going out to do uh, to one of our research areas for bipedal canine or, or whatever we're looking for. I mean, that's days putting up the tents, putting up the canopies, putting up the tables, setting up all the electronics, making the satellite communication hookups, you know, building a fire, you know, eating cold hot dogs and beans, the whole nine yards, and that's the way it's done. I mean, you just can't go out for an hour and a half, two hours, unless the research area is in your backyard and it's fenced in and you know he's inside the fenced-in area. That's the only way it makes sense. Um... Now, uh, the researcher in Wisconsin that I really like a lot, and what he does is he goes out every weekend, and he has a specific research area that he's been working on for a number, quite a number of years, and he's gotten some pretty good, inf- pretty good stuff out of there. He's gotten some decent footprints and some decent photographs. He can't exactly identify what he's got, but he's got it, and that alone is satisfaction. And if you're going to go out and get rained on and or you know, you're going to get wet or you're going to get cold or, you know, you'd rather be at the bar with your buddies or something like that. You shouldn't be there to begin with. I mean, if you're looking for the truth, you got to go find it. you got to hunt it. It's not going to come to you. you got to find it. And um, uh, being around like-minded people is a great, <laughs> that's a great help. I mean, if you got one person in the group that's really, you know, a pain in the butt, it, it can ruin a whole, a whole expedition. Um uh, Fortunate that my guys, I can call on the phone at 3 in the morning and say, hey, saddle up, we're heading for Virginia. And, you know, I pick them up and off we go. And uh, it's it's hard to find those kind of people. Um, you know, a lot of younger folks would rather be out partying than running around in the woods, but there are some out there. Um, the junior scientists are the ones that scare me to death. <laughs> Why is that? Oh, you know, they got all kind of ideas like, well, you know, if we put this white phosphorus bomb over here in the corner and set it off, it may bring something out of the woods. I said, yeah, it might blow my truck up, too. Uh, or or they start, they'll sit there and they're working on, they're doing equations. And I'm like, what are you doing? And, well, we should have a meteor fly overhead in the next 20 minutes. And I said, well, you stand there and watch and let me know what happens. And 20 minutes later, they come over and they got a stiff neck and ask me if you got any Ben Gay on the truck. Hey, just crack. I got a bunch of questions that are lining up here, my friend, for you. And okay. normally we don't start the questions for uh, until hour number two, but I think the way they're building up, it, it kind of goes with what we're doing. We're going to start off with New Joe here. New Joe is asking, mm-hmm. Butch, have you ever found any advantage at times to investigating solo? Uh, no, I try not to do that because... You never know what could happen. I mean, um, a real prime example of that is when I was in the police department, we had a young fellow that came on board, and he just had it in himself that he didn't want to ride with anybody. He wanted to go out there and do everything by himself. And one night, in, if he would have had a second officer with him, it would have worked out fine because one officer would have been at one end of the cemetery, and he would have been at the other end of the cemetery. It was a very high fence. Nobody could have jumped Instead, he wanted to chase this guy down by himself, and the only thing happened was he tripped and went header into a tombstone, which got him about eight stitches and a very bad headache. Uh, no, I, I try not to go out on my own. Uh, if it would be something, now I, I will go interview and on my own, but I I won't do an investigation on my own because you know you might be in somebody else's house. You don't really know these people. 
Um, you don't know what's going on. It's, it's always good to be at least with one person with you. Um, Never mind I the safety and, aspect. The safety aspect. Well, yeah, I mean, you don't you don't know where you're going or what would happen if you trip and fall and knock yourself crazy and wind up bleeding to death floor in some old abandoned house. I, it's just not a good idea to go alone. Uh, mm-hmm. It's always good to have friends with you. Well, you you know what? Where I have my Bigfoot gifting site, mm-hmm. I've been there numerous times. I know where the road is. I know where I park my truck. My my truck is always parked in the exact same spot. And I'll tell you, one day when I was in there, I was doing circles. I was with someone very experienced. And I'm like, we got to go this way to exit. He's like, dude, he goes, we're going to go deeper into the forest. I'm like, no, that's the road. Like sometimes your mind will play tricks on you out in the forest and you get lost just like that. And I am a very cautious person when it comes to that. Very cautious. That happens to a lot of people that go out in the desert. Uh, you know, they, they're not familiar. You know, once you get out in the middle of the desert, and well, I'm, I'm saying desert, like Arizona, I mean, you stand, in, stand out there in the Sonoran Desert and you're looking at the mountains, you know, that's a Tucson mountain, that's this mountain, this is that mountain. If you're not real familiar with those mountains and you turn around in one full circle, you're going to head in the wrong direction. You probably wind yourself up in Mexico. Yeah. But... That, that and that and that happens to a lot of experienced people in in especially in in the paranormal, where you know they'll go into uh, these old state hospitals or in, insane asylums and stuff like that. They're by themselves and they start marching around that building. They have no idea where they're going. Next thing you know, they don't know how to get out. I can see. Didn't that. we come through that? No, we didn't come through that door. We went through that door. Well, wait a minute. And you tell them that well, there's like 300 doors in this building. Which one did you go through? Yeah. And they have no. And I always tell people, if you're going out in the woods, you want to have a GPS with you. Always. We always carry them. And if you can't you, afford a GPS, at least bring some colored string or something oh, yeah. that you can tie. Like, it's cheap. Go to go to the dollar store, get some fluorescent wool, and tie mm-hmm. it every so often, just tie it to a tree, up high at eye level. It's that simple. Yeah, a lot of, look, a lot of hunters still use rocks. Yeah. You know, they, they'll, they'll put rocks and, and they'll make them in, in the form of an arrow or, or a circle, you know. They're, they're just, there's a lot of ways of doing it, but no, there's not some people that are just not too smart. But if you have uh, a good compass or GPS uh, and you know the area you're going into, which I always tell people, if you're going into an area you've never been, you need to look at a map. You need to know the roads and write them down on a piece of paper. There's waterproof paper and waterproof pens. That can, you can soak it in the lake and pick it up and read it. But topo maps, compasses, um, uh, GPS units, uh, some phones even have GPS uh, units already built into them. Uh, you need to know where you're going before you go. And, you know, you go walking off into the woods, you only have to go in about 50 feet, and it all starts to look alike. Oh, yes. Very easy to get disoriented. Especially in your area. Oh. I mean, now we have deep forests down here, but there's a lot of roadways and stuff that, you know, connect to this, and then there's a lot mm-hmm. of railroads going there and stuff from the old days. But up where you live, oh, no my way. Friend, I've, you, you know, I'm going, I'm going out into the forest tomorrow because i got to get a load of firewood. But I can tell you right now, I'm not going off the road. It, you know, it, it's silly. It's silly. You know, you may see a tree 100 feet in thinking, wow, I'll go cut that down. You don't know. You don't know what's going to happen, right? I mean, you got to think safety first before you go into the bushes because that's where things get ugly and ugly quickly. You know, another thing, when uh, a lot of these folks, and when you say it, they laugh at you and say, like, do you, do you have a first aid kit with you? What do you need that for? Well, you know be nice to have one just in case you know opened up your arm with about a four inch slash because you ran against or fell against or you know a rock or a tree or something like that or you got a knot in your head that's profusely bleeding all over your face you might want something and um some people do and some people don't and they don't realize uh you know what kills me well people go into these deep dark areas of the forest they have no idea What's walking around in there? 
And I'm not talking now. Forget Bigfoot. Forget bipedals. Everything else. Oh my God! It's amazing you mention I, that because my son and I went out to get a load of firewood last mm-hmm. week, and he was in the truck because when I'm when I'm cutting trees, I don't allow him out out of the truck. It's just for safety. You know what I'm saying? Five year old mm-hmm. wander off. You just never know. You'll never find him. Anyways, long story short, out of the corner of my eye, I see something big and black walking down the road towards me. I've got my chainsaw going full tilt, and I I stop my chainsaw, I look up, because I'm thinking, oh, crap, that is one giant black bear, and it's a cow. I mean, that's how <laughs> quietly something can, can uh, you know, uh, come up at you. It's just that oh, quickly. Yeah. I've been walking down trails and walked right by a coyote and never saw him. Yeah, all the time. And the here. guy in front of me turned around and he goes like, did you see the coyote? I'm going like, what coyote? He said, the one you just walked past. I'm like, I didn't walk all past that time. coyote. But look, it was only a foot away from me. I never yeah. saw it. We drove by a moose that was 12 feet away. I didn't see it. My buddy Mark did. Moose, hey, that's big. When you get out in the woods, it is yeah. crazy. It was, especially, you know, uh, if somebody's a, been a hunter all their life and, you know, they're used to that or they're Boy Scouts or whatever, they've been in the woods a lot, that's different. You get somebody that lived in the inner city all their life yeah, and put them in the, in the deep woods, and I mean the deep woods like a big state or federal park, you might as well take that same person and put them on the moon because that's just the way it's going to be. They have no idea where they're going. They have no idea what they're going to run into. They're not prepared for anything. Agreed. Uh, uh, you know, you're, you're looking at me, you're going like, I wonder which funeral director I should call. Hey, Butch, I'm going to get you to hold on right there because we're going to hop out for our first break of the night. Butch Witkowski, Strange Days Happens, the final Monday of every month. We'll be back with more Butch Witkowski and Cryptid Talk right after this on Spaced Out Radio. Find your escape where time has no limits. It's about living today and cherishing the heritage of yesterday. A spirit of adventure for what is new with the nostalgia of the past. Your timepiece is a reflection of who you are. Life surrounded by beauty from the world around us to the soul within. Escapewatches.com There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. The freedom to post what you want, when you want. That's the social media freedom you need. Social Media Freedom is the free app in your app store. No need to worry about going to jail or being shadow banned any longer. It's the freedom to say what you feel. The freedom to know Big Brother isn't watching. It's the way social media is supposed to be. Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. Download from your app store today. Coming September 28th to the 30th, it's our first annual Caribou Paracon, put on by Spaced Out Radio and the Canadian Society of Questers. Three days of paranormal, supernatural, and spiritual knowledge in the beautiful 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Tickets are $150 Canadian for the event, being held at the Spruce Hills Resort and Spa. Come watch our featured speaker, Grant Cameron, along with Lorian Fenton, David Weatherly, Ross Allison, and more. The Caribou Paracon, celebrating everything paranormal. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski, lead investigator with Euphorcop. On the final Monday of every month, you can listen to me and host Dave Scott on Spaced Out Radio's Strange Days. We're going to get to the heart of the matter when it comes to what's happening out there. People are seeing and experiencing things from ET contact to Bigfoot, and I want to hear about it. Your experiences are what we investigators need to help solve these unknown mysteries. So tune in at spacedoutradio.com to the final Monday of every month from Butch Wachowski's Strange Days. Hi there, this is Tessa Nicole Thomas, and I'm going to take you for a ride every Sunday night on Spaced Out Sundays. I'm going to set up your week with some strange tales from across North America, from psychic readings, Sasquatch, UFOs, to the most haunted locations. Come join me at spacedoutradio.com starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern, and let's get weird together. I'd love for you to join me. Spaced Out Sundays at spacedoutradio.com. There's news, and there's the encounter. This is Spaced Out Radio News Director Everett Themer inviting you to check out The Encounter. Our half-hour news segment every Monday through Friday night is different compared to what you're used to. Our goal is to bring you the weird, strange, and interesting stories the mainstream tends to leave out 
and stories that will make you scratch your head in disbelief. The encounter can also be found at spacedoutradio.com and on our Facebook page, SOR The Encounter. Come give us a read. We're bringing scientific thought to the paranormal. Hi there, this is Spaced Out Radio scientist Chris Cogswell. Join me, Chris Zuger and Dave Scott, the second Wednesday of every month, where we break down the who from the woo when it comes to everything paranormal. We'll investigate and try to bring sensible answers to those straight and sometimes outlandish questions people have. Hey, not everything has an answer, but we'll do our best. Listen in to Reality Paranormal only on Spaced Out Radio. Heading to Vancouver and looking for some great nightlife? The Moose Vancouver is the place to be. Catch a game on one of the big screens or just come rock out to your favorite 80s and 90s hair bands. Great food starting at $6.95. The Moose Vancouver is open until 2 a.m. nightly. It's easy to find near the corner of Nelson and Granville. The Moose Vancouver is the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Are you interested in advertising on Spaced Out Radio? Head to our website at spacedoutradio.com and click on our advertising tab. There, you will find an assortment of ways you can get your product out there with us, from radio commercials to banners and social media. Have a product you like our hosts to endorse? We can do that too. Visit spacedoutradio.com for more details. Do you want to know what's really going on in your world? Do you have questions about who you can trust in the mainstream media? Then look no further than the Rebel Planet. Come get the straight answers right here at spacedoutradio.com. Join me, Jamie Sexton, creator of Rebel Planet News, as I fill you in on the stories behind the stories. All you truth seekers, be sure to tune in to Rebel Planet on spacedoutradio.com the third Thursday of every month. Visit purpleplates.com today. For over 40 years, the Purple Energy Plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers. Inspired by the great genius Nikola Tesla, the harmony, healing, and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers. Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Hey, this is Canadian Paranormal Investigator Mike Moore. The third Wednesday of every month, I'll be teaming up with Dave Scott to bring you Ghosts of the Great White North. Each month, we will bring on guests from across Canada to discuss their ghostly encounters. Canada is a paranormal hotbed with stories you've never heard, so we're going to bring them to you. So get comfy on your Chesterfield, grab a donut, and join us, eh? The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio, Spaced Out Weekend, Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. Would you like to connect with us? Head to spacedoutradio.com for all your latest show info. And hit us up on Twitter using the hashtag Spaced Out Radio. Now, back to Dave Scott and SOR. Welcome back to hour number two of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Thank you so much for being with us. Tomorrow night on the show, comedian David Race joins us. He's coming out as the paranormal comedian. We get going at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern at spacedoutradio.com. Hello to everyone listening in on the SOR Radio Network and Deep Talk Radio. All of our archives are on our YouTube channel. Go to youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me a favor hit that subscribe button. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Synesthete. 
Sinisthet is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, space travelers, as Bill sets the password each and every night right here on the Mighty SOR. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to Bumblefoot, shop at our store, read up on the encounter online, and so much more. Don't forget, you can go to questers.ca right now questers.ca click on the fall conference get your tickets for the first annual caribou paracon it's this weekend presented by spaced out radio and the canadian society of questers we want to see you all up there we've got about 100 tickets sold so far we want to see a bunch more love to see you all up here in the beautiful caribou region of british columbia this weekend butch witkowski's strange days happens the final monday of every month butch's next appearance on this show will be monday october 29th just a couple of days before Halloween. I'm sure he can round up some scary stories for that one. Butch, welcome back. Yes, sir. Good to be back. UFO and I can hear you. Cop. Yes, and I appreciate that. UFO Cop is your website. UFO R C O P. What does that Correct. stand for? UFO Research Center of Pennsylvania. There you go. There you go. Hey, I want to get into trail cams. Okay. What's your what's your opinion of trail cams? When it comes to research, good, bad, indifferent. Um, it, it that, well, that's kind of a. I really can't answer it that way. There are uh, really cheap trail cams that are pretty much worthless, and then there are you know some that are <clears throat> a little more expensive, and it depends what you're using it for. Uh, you know, if, um, some people buy them just to watch their backyard, you know, or they, or they like to watch deer roam through the yard or, or whatever. And then there are the ones that are really costly. And then there are the surveillance type trail cams where, um, they are shooting infrared. I mean, they can switch from infrared daylight, nighttime and thermal imaging. Well, that's the kind we have, uh, because, uh, something could be in the in a wooded. You could have it pointed toward a wooded area, and something could be standing in there. But if it was just a, a color camera taking a shot, uh, it would. You know, if there's movement, you're just going to get something in the woods which you can't identify anyway. With thermal imaging, you're able to see exactly what's in the woods that's making that movement. And then you got a, the, the. I don't like the trail cams that are set off by something walking in front of them. Um, they have issues. A leaf goes by, uh, or, or, or a good stiff breeze, and it'll set that trail cam off. Where uh, the the ones that we use, uh, they take a shot every second. They take a picture, whether somebody's walking or not. There's a photograph, and then they they'll print out when you look up, when you're looking on, over on the computer, you're looking at a strip of eight shots, you know, and they're they're dated, they're timed. And um, uh, it just works better for us because it, it, you, can, I, you can get those with a much wider angle lens. Uh, there's no flash. There's no noise. They're totally silent. And, um, but they're extremely expensive. And I don't, I'm not telling anybody to go out and buy those. They're not what they need. Uh, a decent trail cam you can get, you know, at like Cabela's or one of those places for like 60, 70 bucks on sale. And... Um, they are, they work really well for what people are using them for. Um, I'm more interested in getting the photograph. Um, but it, it's, 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 the ones that say they're infrared, a lot of times they don't work very well because it, the intensifier tube in infrared that you would get in one of those cameras is certainly not the intensifier tube you're going to get in a FLIR type camera. You're talking about what a hundred dollars as opposed to a couple thousand dollars. So the intensifier tube is totally different and you'll get a lot of white shots with, um, the, um, more inexpensive, uh, trail cams and all the white shot is, it's it's just, it's just a missed picture. It just, it, it, it took something, but, the the lens opening it didn't it didn't react fast enough so it it's actually trapped like and you can do that with a camera too uh, the old especially the old film cameras if you didn't depress the uh, trigger all the way down the camera set off at maybe the three quarter point 
you just got a picture that's either black or white or just blurred. I mean, it's all you got. But there, there are some really good trail cams out now. Prices have come down a great deal over the years. Um, a lot of people now have gone to GoPro. They've done away with, you know, they're not using trail cams. They're using GoPro. Because uh, you can, you know, they have battery packs for them now. You can put those out for a couple of weeks. They're totally waterproof, and they're, they're doing video. They're not taking a picture. They're running video, and they can run it in infrared, and they can run it in thermal imaging. Of course, the more you get into that stuff, the higher price goes. But GoPros work just fine. Um, I I, I had a gentleman ask me one time. He says, well, I'm going through the woods. I got my GoPro strapped on the the front of my um, uh, backpack, you know. I said, okay. He said, so, but I always hear stuff behind me, so what do I, why do I always have to turn around and stop and look? I said, no, why don't you just get another GoPro and put it on the back of your backpack so you got one going forward and you got one looking backwards? Oh, I never thought of that. <laughs> God. There's, look, there's a lot of neat stuff out there. Um, a lot of the newest game camps out are the, uh, um, you can mount those on a tree. Like, say, up in your area, you can mount that maybe a half a mile from your house, uh, looking up a trail, and you can go back at the computer and watch it. It's Wi-Fi. Yeah, very expensive. Okay. That'd be okay. Very though. expensive. Very cool. Mm-hmm. Well, the reason why I ask about trail cams, this leads to Mike's question. He's saying, Butch, have you had any experience with trail cams going white on shots at night? He says he left one of his trail cams in the bush for a few nights, caught deer, bear, two hunters, and there were 10 white shots. The camera was functioning fine when he picked it up, and it's never happened before. Hmm. I would say that's a camera issue. Um, When I was talking about white shots before, that's... uh, so that that would be if the camera was strictly infrared. Now, if his camera is strictly infrared and he's getting white shots, then he's got an intensifier tube issue. A lot if of people. Got, a lot of people, though, will if they're say capturing. Let's say they're in a Bigfoot area. All right, mm-hmm. a known Bigfoot area. A lot of people will say that they get those white spots or white orbs or their camera will black out when Sasquatch is around. Well, I'll tell you what. Uh, there's a lot of strange things that happen with trail cams. Um, the um, the guy that was professing, he had Bigfoot on a trail cam, and he had like six or eight shots of this furry uh, movement in front of the camera and it turned out to be the neighbor's cat. So a good thing is never put those things low to the ground. You want to get them up high. I mean, if you're looking for something that's six to eight foot tall, put it up at six foot. Put it at five foot. But um, it depends a lot on the camera. You know, like the brand name cameras have much better lenses. They're quieter. Um they're they're not prone to breakage like some of them. Um, I know the first ones we had were pretty much junk. They they were always an issue with those things. Uh, either what it wouldn't record the SD card properly, and oh, and that's another thing that'll cause white spots. If you got a, if it's if the car if that uses a SD card, and the SD card has an issue, you'll get white spots. As a matter of fact, you'll get a whole white out in picture. Mike is saying he has a black light one. It's set to take mm-hmm. pictures every five seconds mm-hmm. and will capture out to about 100 feet. Mm-hmm. And is he using an SD card? I will have to wait on that because there is a delay between what yeah, we're yeah. saying in the chat room. So, Mike, let us know about uh, if you use an SD card or not. You might want to change that up. While we're going on the fact of uh, trail cams, What's the most interesting photo that you have received on a trail cam that you just cannot explain? Uh, I have one from upstate Pennsylvania up near the New York border that there's a definite outline of a bipedal 
something. And when I say something, that's as close as I can get. It doesn't look like a you know wolf type head. Um, it's big. Um, it's definitely bipedal, but it's just. It was just at that point where it was just out of range of that camera's lens. You know what I mean? It was just too far away. I, I don't know what the camera was set up for. I think when I did look up the camera, it's like one of those in like 150 feet or something like that. And this was way out over that. But you can definitely see the outline against um, pretty naked forest at that point because it was in November. And a lot of the background uh, from snow and stuff was white, so it really stuck out. But, even the, you know, when you get something far away like that and you try to blow it up, it just distorts it all. It just disappears on you. So I really couldn't do anything. With, I, I tried clearing it up. I tried, you know, taking, uh, um, peeling off some of the, the, some of the color and adding some color. And it just didn't work. It just kept going away. But I think the guy got a good picture. And uh, I know he's still at it. It's on his private property. It's on his farm. It's in a corner of his farm that has a lot of heavy woods that they don't do anything with. And he's got a game cam out there for a long time. So that was the only one he got. But he's got something there. It's just a shame that it was too far away. He had that camera way too far away. There's like an outbuilding from the shed that's about 250 yards away. And then there's a small fence that runs out maybe... I don't know, 50 yards or 75 yards. Well, he attached it to the last post on that fence, which still put that thing, you know, a long way off. And uh, that's that was that was his only mistake. But whatever he got, he got, and it's and it's not small. That's for sure. What do you think it was? Well, if I tell you the truth, if I had to guess. I would say it was probably the big fella. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's exactly what it looks like. I mean, like you can't really define a, a large head, broad shoulders, and all that stuff because it's kind of sideways. But from the size of that, and and I had him measure that tree because it's a very there's only like three branches, and it was you know really getting out. But that last branch was 10 foot and this thing was just lower a little bit lower than that 10 foot branch wow, I, I i think that's big i think he actually i think he actually got one but like i said it's just too far away you can't bring it in and when you do bring it in it just distorts it that it just blurs out and you don't even see anything anymore which is sad got but couple, you live and learn i got a couple of bigfoot questions here from our audience we're going to start off with michael's here hi pen man how you doing man he is asking, Butch, do you or did you get any reports of Bigfoot during or after the recent flooding in Pennsylvania? No, none. Matter of fact, um, uh, pretty much all the sighting reports were zero. UFOs, uh, crypto, nothing. There weren't any reports flying around at all. Um, no, no, none that I can even think of. And I was looking for some, but I didn't. I don't think I found anything at all. Now, that do, that down doesn't south, surprise me. Yeah, but now down south, where they had a lot of heavy flooding in the in the Carolinas, uh, there were a number of UFO reports. Do you think they were looking at the tornado, investigating well, the tornado? Well, um hurricane uh the there are a lot of photographs that go way back um where you have volcanoes erupting uh natural disasters typhoons um where these things are there they're there and why i have no idea what they're looking for or what they're what they're doing they're certainly not causing it i don't not that i can think of anything like that but uh, they're just they're there. There's a there's a great shot over um, one of the um, volcanoes uh, in the Philippines that just erupted not too awful long ago. There's a great shot of a flat out saucer standing, you know, just right off to the left of it. And then uh, there's a series of photographs that was taken, and you can see the thing go right through the smoke and come out the other side. Now, I, why I have no idea what what interest they would have in that. Unless it's just an energy, maybe, that they don't understand.
I know up here with our Bigfoot gifting site, this year has been completely dead. Completely dead. And I am ruling that due to the forest fires from last year. Probably. And I'm surprised that they haven't come back. But even looking in that area, there isn't a lot of wildlife. We're not seeing a lot of deer around there. We're not seeing a lot of action, not even, you know, footprints. Like, it's very, very sparse. <clears throat> well, uh, that the one fire they had in Northern California, um, which there was, I guess there was, a, it's a big park, state park, where they had a large concentration of deer. Um, and that, that fire ended, I think, two months two month ago, maybe? Not quite two months ago. They haven't seen any activity of any wildlife at all in that whole area. Now, I guess maybe first thing that comes to my mind is, well, you burned everything out. There's nothing to eat, so they're moved on, you know. But uh, you don't know. Uh, but that, that's not unheard of. I heard that before where, um, you know, there was a fire, a forest fire or something like that, and, you know, people were getting some evidence of some type, and that evidence just went away after the fire. It wasn't there anymore. Well, this leads to another question from New Joe, because we have a couple of Joes in our chat room right now. He's asking, Butch, do you put any credence in Bigfoot signs in the woods, such as tree tripods and other weird tree arrangements? Well, yeah, well, it depends. I mean, a lot, you know, in the wintertime, uh, or high winds or old trees, there a lot of stuff falls to the ground. Uh, I mean, you know, so you get a lot of trees crossed over and stuff like that. But uh, there was one uh, photograph, and gee, I'm trying to think of where it was. I can't remember, but uh, the guys went in looking uh, to their spot where they go, their research area, and there was a tree that was snapped off about four foot above ground level. It was a fresh break. This was not a dead tree. And then it was hung up between two trees, kind of like a, um, in a football stadium, you know? And first of all, although the tree was only about six, seven inches in diameter, how did that tree break? I mean, four foot off the ground, it looks like, you know, it was like broken and twisted off. And then it was placed up like a goalpost higher in the tree. And that was like 14 foot off the ground. Now that's strange. That one is a strange one. Matter of fact, I think that's on YouTube. I think there's a lot of situations out there where Mother Nature does some pretty funky things. Oh, pretty yeah. funky things. You know, this reminds me, I believe it was either David Weatherly or John Tenney told me. And spe and this will also include for trail cams. But a lot of times, and I don't know if you've seen this, Butch. But there are a lot of people who claim that if you take, leave a trail cam out and you just let it run and let it take pictures every three to four seconds, five seconds, whatever it may be, and you run straight through those photos, doesn't matter what you catch, but eventually you will see something move like a tree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Like all of a sudden, yeah, we, all of a sudden, you'll see a tree, you know, right in front of you, and the next image over, it is like a couple inches on frame to the left or to the right, and then mm -hmm. all of a sudden, it goes back to where it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that that that's kind of a weird anomaly. Uh, we've seen it on our our not our surveillance cameras, but our older uh, trail cam, the one trail cam. That was a pretty expensive one, I thought, for 150 bucks. But um, that seemed to do it a lot, and I don't know what causes that, unless that the camera that's inside the casing, you know, there's only like two screws hold them on uh, inside the casing. You know, it keeps it in place. Is, but I don't know what would cause it to move. You know, if it was loose, I, what what force would cause it to move? But then again, I'm still trying to figure out why there are flashes of light being recorded on trail cams in Bigfoot areas and bipedal areas. I haven't figured that one out yet. 
bright flashes of light like a flashlight, like a flashbulb. Right. And, Lots of mystery. And there's like, I've seen four reports in the last six months that described that flash of light and then something was seen or something was seen and then there was a flash of light. One, way, one went one way and one went the other way. But very bright. And the one was caught with a Nikon uh, D5 camera, which is a very expensive, very good camera. And the guy said it was like photographing the sun. It actually, most digital cameras have a protection with their lenses where if they get in too much light, they shut it down. So you, if, like if you took a picture of the sun with a digital camera, all you would get was a black spot. There'd be like a real light ring around it, but a, a pure black spot. That's the camera protecting itself. In other words, it recognized that uh, there was too much light, so it shut that that shutter was gone. That shut ain't gonna open. And um, I started looking back on uh, some older reports, and I was surprised to find out how many uh, reports there are like that, where um, a Bigfoot is seen, and then there's a bright flash, a flash of light, and he's gone, or there's a bright flash of light, and then he's there. And people have recorded that with Bigfoot, with deer, with bear, with elk, with moose. And I'm going like, what's that all about? But it's always in the woods. It's never outside the wooded area. And it's just this bright flash. And there's a moose. And then there's another bright flash, and the moose ain't there anymore. So what is that all about? I have no idea. That's bizarre. I have no idea. That's bizarre. Let's move on on the questions here, my friend. Gail is asking, she goes, Bush, have you ever noticed the preponderance of investigators? Is it different in regards to the race of person? You mean like? Say, for instance, if if you're closer to the Mexican border, would a Mexican investigator get more information, say either paranormal or whatever, because of the lineage than, say, a Caucasian person? Well, I guess that would depend, you know, if they're into some of the strange religions they have down in that area. Um, other than that, no, I, I, no, I've not noticed anything. Well, I'll tell you what I have noticed. I've noticed uh, that there's not, you know, white, white male and white female Caucasian make up 99.9% of all the researchers. In all my time, I've met two black researchers, very, very nice guys, very thoughtful, very intelligent, and they know what they're doing, two in 30 years. Why is that? Why is that? I think people outside of the Caucasian community have better things to do with their time, be more productive. Yeah, probably. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, probably. It, it just always struck me like, you know, and women in ufology, um, don't see a lot of them anymore either. Yeah, uh, the, I mean, outside of Lori and Fenton, Melinda Leslie, Misha Johnson, you can put Teresa Yanaros's name on there as well. There isn't a lot of Linda Bolton Howe. There isn't a lot of women in ufology. Well, a couple more. Chase Klutsky. With mm-hmm. MUFON? Yeah, that's just, I, I don't understand that because, let's face it, they're smarter than we are. They are, they Wait. think different. They think different. They are, you could do a you checkbook perfectly and then turn it over to your wife or girlfriend and let her do the same checkbook and it's It'll make you look like an idiot. Oh, isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? But I think, uh, now, I I did get to know one uh, that was in this area, and she's now moved up into New York, and she's more into the paranormal now, but when she was involved in ufology, boy, I'll tell you what, she was something to keep up with. Um, But, um, you know, women... um, uh, uh, black, I, I, uh, Spanish. I mean, no, I. They're just not there. 
I, I, and I don't know why. I just don't understand that. I don't think it would be anything where somebody's being ugly about anything like that. Um, at least I hope that's not the case. But um, like I said, uh, 30 years I met two two black investigators, uh, both in the Philadelphia area, both very smart guys, and they knew what they were doing. And after a while, even they went away. They weren't there anymore. So it's just, uh, I think it's sad because I'd like to see a whole lot of people out there. I don't care if they're green. Uh, yeah, now they're more in the gray line. At least that's what they tell me. Yeah, true. Reptilians, green. Yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah, green would be a good color. You'll find more shots at daytime than you will at night. Right. Um, if you have if you have a camera that does night night shot. Yeah. Okay. And you turn it on night shot and put it on a tripod, and just point it up to the sky and let it alone. Run, run, run your uh, focal mm-hmm. all the way out to infinity. Mm-hmm. I will guarantee you, you get something. Right. There's a fellow up in uh, the other side of Schuylkill County, uh, older gentleman, and when he first told me about what he was doing, and this is going back a while. This is going back probably 2007, 2006. I kind of chuckled. I thought this guy's got more time to waste than I do. But anyway, what he did was he got four Sony, and I can't remember the model number. We have one in the truck. But anyway, after I saw his stuff, I bought one. Um, Sony night shot camera, and he has four of those mounted on a bar, which is mounted on two tripods. And all the wires and everything go into his house, onto his computer, so he can watch what's going on. And he telling me he's really getting some great shots. And I said, well, sometime I'll come up and take a look. And he said, no, I said, I'll send you a bunch of CDs. And I like a few days later, I got these CDs. I was flabbergasted. I mean, he's got uh, the broad daylight, absolute sunny, clear sky day with very few, a few cumulus clouds hanging out here and there. And there goes like a whole fleet of them, like four or five or six triangles, saucer shaped, uh, uh, rectangular, uh, I just the whole gamut, plus com- you know commercial aircraft and stuff like that. And he said, "I've been doing this for years." I went like, "Wow!" And so I said, oh, "I'll send you back your CD." And oh, they're yours to keep. So over time, since back then till now, I probably get a CD a month. <laughs> so I've got a whole bunch of his CDs. But yeah, that's a good time to take pictures of UFOs. I've never seen, I, I, I've only seen one, two, three in the daylight out of all the UFOs I've seen. And I'm, and, one be- these, and I'm one of these dudes, I will literally lie in my backyard for hours just staring up at the sky, and I get nothing. Nothing, well, I tell yeah, you. Yeah. I'm ripped off. Yeah. Well, you in the daytime, it'll look like a really brilliant white light. Or a very black spot. That's the only two things it'll look like. <clears throat> I like the naked eye ones. I want to see something oh. with the naked eye. Oh, yeah. Well, we, we do a star watch down in French Creek area, which is like one of the darkest areas of Pennsylvania. There's no light pollution whatsoever. And in a matter of you just setting up and sitting your butt down the chair and pouring a cup of coffee and looking up, there to go. <laughs> I mean, you know, get the okay. cameras rolling. They're really okay. cool. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's uh, it's something, you know, like I, I would love to see like a, a black triangle in the daytime. That's what I really want to see. You know, I mean, you can see those silver specks way up near the clouds and you're like, you know, is that a balloon or is that a UFO or is that a, a drone or something like that? I want a black triangle. That's what I want during the day. I'm going to try and manifest that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, there's there's so many. I, when I think of all the things that we I've seen over time, when somebody says to me there are no such thing as UFOs, I just got to look at them and go, like, how dumb are you? <laughs> I mean, just, you know, 
you know, I'm standing there with two state troopers. We're all looking up at the sky and we're watching this thing. And I said, you see that much? Oh, yeah, I see them all the time. I'm going, like, oh, wow. So, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's what you want to do, what you're looking for. And I know people go out and they'll look up and then they get that, they get that look on their face like their mouth is hanging open and, you know, they're trying to catch flies. But um, then they get tired of it after two or three minutes and they put their head back down. I always tell them, like, get yourself a nice recliner. You know what I mean? A nice one of those beach chairs and sit your butt in there and just watch it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I think so, too. I think so, too. I mean, I I got to spend more time outside. I've spent a lot of time inside the last few months. Not that I'm a hermit or anything, but just preparing for what we're doing behind the scenes with the show and everything. And I got to tell you, there's nothing like being outside. Do you find that the time of year is changes and i realize there's more sightings in summer and springtime because more people are staying outside a little bit more and they're enjoying the good weather and you know they may catch something on their camera that or even in their eyesight that they can't explain but in your opinion take that out of there out of the the picture out of the statistics what's your favorite time of year to capture any type of sighting i watch september october november now, why is that? Uh, colder, clearer skies. Do you think it has anything to do with the the fall, you know, the, heat. the fall uh, or autumn solstice or whatever they call that, the equinox? Yeah, kind of. But in in the summertime, sometimes you get a haze from the humidity, and that takes out the sky, or you get a lot of clouds from rain and stuff like that. We're in that late September, all of October, all. Of and into December, old clear skies. And I mean, they are clear. I mean, anything you want to look at. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Try being in a 30 below sky, man. Standing in mm-hmm. your winter jacket and everything, staying nice and warm. I'll tell you, literally, you will see millions of stars in the sky. Like, mm-hmm. it is the most beautiful, beautiful sight. Oh, yeah. It's, Star, it, it, stars it, it, so bright that even, even street lights don't even drown them out. Nope. I can see that. I can see that. What about cloudy days? Where are the UFOs uh, hiding on the cloudy days? Because you always see, uh, I, I never know if these videos are CGI or not. You know, some of them are pretty darn hard to tell whether or not, you know, you see these UFOs coming out of clouds or hiding uh, in clouds. Yeah, but there's a lot of pictures of those day and night. I mean,. Um, a lot of a lot of really good shots of UFOs were taken right after our thunderstorms. You know, when you got the clouds are moving out, the thunderstorm is over, and now the clouds are moving out, and they'll they'll make themselves visible, going from one cloud to another. Or, you know, pretty neat. Mm-hmm. Let's move over to Bigfoot for a second. Okay. I know we were just there, but another couple of questions have come up, and we always like to get the audience in and interactive with you. New Joe is asking, Butch, have you ever experienced the flashes of light in any specific colors in the woods? Uh, mostly white. Very bright white, like an old-time flash bulb. You know, like two inches from your face and firing it. Yeah, that type of white light. But nothing, no colored. Uh, although there was one that was more silverish, but that could have just been, you know, my eyes or the camera. Um but mostly white, but just bright white. And I can't explain how bright that white is. I mean, it's just, it kills the camera. That's number one. And then, you know, you, after you look away, you're still looking at spots, you know. So it's bright. But uh, the only other one, I think, was a silver color. It was, uh, it was a shimmer. It was a silver shimmer. That was a bipedal report. Mm-hmm. Could you tell us about it? Yeah. The guy said uh, when he saw it and it stood up, it was actually on on the ground chewing on something. And when it stood up, uh, he said it looked like it had a silver aura around it, on the ground, all around it, and down to the ground again. And then as they got closer, the aura disappeared. And then that's when they actually saw 
the 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 creature, which was only at that point about fifteen feet away from the side of their car. But um, yeah, that was the only one that was not white. Everything else we've had has been white, whether it was Bigfoot or bipedal, just bright white. And I mean, hurt your eyes white. Wow. That sounds intense. I don't know what causes it, though. You know, I tried to... uh, There's a lot of people looking at trying to figure out what it is, like, um, especially up in the Fayette uh, County area, they... A lot of the Bigfoot sightings up in that area um, are being accompanied by bright white lights, bright flashes in this, in the in the wooded areas, and then all of a sudden there it is, you know, or at least that's what they're reporting. Interesting. Let's get to another question. This one from Mike. He is asking, Butch, have you looked into Bigfoot sightings in the Fayette and Armstrong counties near you? There's reported vocalizations around that area. Uh, yeah, that's uh, one of our research areas, as a matter of fact. Um, that, you know, you're talking about the ridge up there, and um, there are... <laughs> I think it's the biggest concentration of Bigfoot reports in all of Pennsylvania is in the Fayette County area. Uh, the Chestnut Ridge runs from through Fayette, uh, Armstrong Fayette, and then you know goes over and pretty much goes into West Virginia. And the reports there are phenomenal. Just so many of them go back so far. And but there's a lot of weird stuff in that area in, in Fayette County. There's a lot of UFO reports. Um, uh, Bigfoot reports. Um, we have no bipedal reports in that area, but a lot of UFO, a lot of paranormal stuff in some of the old abandoned towns and stuff throughout the Chestnut Ridge. It that's a yeah, there's a uh, there's an event up there, a three day event that's held every year. In hold it this year because it's twice as big as it was the last two years. So it will be held again. Uh, it's a Bigfoot camping adventure, they call it. And that's from May 31st to June 2nd. Uh, if you're anywhere in that area, you want to get to that because you're going to have pretty much every known Bigfoot researcher from around the country is going to be there. Um, so, you know, you, they're going to have workshops, so you'll get to learn, participate, you know, experience. They take they take hikers. They take hikes out into the wooded area, and um, it's, it's pretty cool. I've been to the last two, and I'll be going to this one as a guest speaker. So it's um, – if you live in that area, that's, that's, that's the place, place to go. Cheap. <laughs> when it comes to Bigfoot – and dog man. I know mm-hmm. I've asked you this before, so I'm not going to repeat the question of, of territorial uh, advantages for either side, but do you investigate either of these creatures differently or pretty much the same? Pretty much the same, because you're in the same area. I mean, uh, all the sightings we had um in the Lichen Loop, our research area in Pennsylvania, central Pennsylvania from south to north, is very huge. It's a very long and wide area. You know, you got one place got 6,500 square miles of of uh, uh, heavily wooded area, and then there's some 4,000, 3,000, 2,500. I mean, it's just so many large places and they're all connected i mean you can walk from like mashanan state forest into black mashanan state forest by crossing a road cross one road and you went from one six thousand acres to four thousand acres by crossing a road so you got ten thousand acres and uh that's that's probably our best research area up there um there, there are a lot of there are a lot more sightings in Pennsylvania than a lot of people think, and a lot of them are along the Chestnut Ridge. And there are researchers in that area that have been doing it for a long time, and um, 
some of their stories are just phenomenal. Some of the reports are phenomenal. But uh, it's part of our area, too, so we get up there. Uh, we were up on one uh, six months ago where we went up. We spent a weekend up there at an abandoned church. And um, that was really wild, too, because um, we went down to a farm where there were multiple sightings, just to another place where there were multiple sightings. And it is... It's really if you're if you're a researcher and you're really into Bigfoot, Chestnut Ridge is the place to go. I mean, it, it abounds with um, and it's, it's very few homes, um, um, a lot of gas lines, um, you know, running up over the ridge from one place to another. But it's it's very sparse with population, so pretty much got it to yourself. It's it's really a neat place. Yeah, Ronald Murphy, the crypto guru around here, he has written a book about the Chestnut Ridge. And yep. he, he has talked about that so many times on this show, especially early on when he was doing monthly features on this show, even before you came along. I mean, that Chestnut Ridge, there's some hairy activity around there. Oh, my God, yeah. And it's not just Bigfoot. It's UFOs. It's um, paranormal activity. um um, when we were up there for that weekend a little while, there was um, a lady and her husband uh, had been watching a spirit. That's what they described, the spirit. Walk down uh, the road toward their farm, and then it veers off to the left and goes into the woods. And they never thought much of it. They thought it was just some kind of anomaly. But when they started doing some historical research, um during the Civil War, if I got this correct, during the Civil War, um, a mother sent off two sons to fight. Uh, both were killed, and the one was actually killed by a sniper heading back home after the war. And they never found his body, but eventually they did uh, find what was left of him. And um, it was the mother still looking for her son walking down that trail of that road toward the farm and then veering wood. And I went like, now that's wild. Mm -mm -mm." Insane. Yeah. Ronald Murphy has said there's a ton of stuff going on there and there's been strange sightings of everything from fairies to, to gargoyles and trolls in that area. Just a little bit of everything. You heard screams up there that nobody could describe. And I was standing there with five, probably the most prominent Bigfoot guys in this state. And they said, I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> I don't know either. I said, but if it gets any closer, I'm going to shoot it. <laughs> it's it's crazy. I mean, it's just, um, I mean, large snakes. I mean, extremely large timber rattlesnakes. Six, eight foot um uh, mountain lion, which they say we don't have in Pennsylvania, but they're all over the place. Koi wolves, uh, coyotes, um, Bigfoot reports, bipedal reports, UFO reports, paranormal events. I mean, the, 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 that that whole section of the Chestnut Ridge is just, and it's huge. I mean, it's not it's not small. It's 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 a it's a pretty good deal, but it's wild. It is just wild up there. And you listen to some of the stories, and you go like. I don't think I want to live up here. (laughs) We have that area, too. That's kind of where I live, man. There's a little bit of everything up here. That's why I like it up here so much. That's why I like it. Middle of nowhere, man. Mm. I can see you thinking. I can hear you thinking. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> yeah. Daydreaming in the night of, of getting lost in the wilderness of beautiful British Columbia. Well, that's kind of cool. I just looked out my studio window here, and I got the full harvest moon blasting oh, yeah. through the trees right now. Man, is the moon bright tonight. Wow. It's kind of cool. Never really noticed before. It's kind of cool. Get out the camera. <laughs> I can't. I'm a little busy right now. Little busy. Talking about you. <laughs> Do- uh, Dogman. Dogman. Actually, before we get to that, we'll get to a couple more questions from our audience here. 
New Joe is asking, Butch, have you ever investigated the cattle mutilations in the Arizona area and possible skinwalker involvement? Uh, cattle mutilations, uh, not in the Arizona area. Uh, cattle mutilations in Pennsylvania, we never had one reported. Skinwalker involvement, that's a whole other ball game because I... There's too many things going on with these bipedal canines that keep hearkening back to uh, the ways of a skinwalker. So that's always been in the mix. I don't think we'll ever take it out of the mix because it's just too... They're just too close. You know, when, you, when you're describing a bipedal and you're describing... A skinwalker, especially Cherokee, which is a wolf tribe, you know, you're talking about pretty much the same thing. So could it be? Yeah, I guess it could be. Uh, we've, we've talked to the indigenous out there. Um, we gave them our description and sent them a copy, a photograph, of uh, not photograph, a drawing of what we were looking for. They sent me back um, a bunch of stuff to keep me safe <laughs> that I should wear whenever I go out. Because they're, they definitely think it's a skinwalker. Plus the fact that Pennsylvania, up until 1754, there were no white men here. This is all Indian territory. So you have a lot of burial mounds everywhere because these tribes were all at war with each other. And um, Susquehannock were the strongest. They were the biggest, tallest, meanest. And um, everybody was, uh, these, these tribes were all at war. And, you know, like I said, there's burial mounds everywhere. And a good deal of them are right up smack in the middle of our um, research area. So could be skinwalker involvement. Have you, have you had any further human mutilation cases that you've looked at? Uh, no, last one was in England. Um, and that's still under investigation by the researchers over there. <clears throat> none, none other than that one. Uh, I mean that we're aware of. I mean, so, if I never get another one, it won't. Well, that has to be grotesque, my friend. Literally man, grotesque. That, absolutely. When I read that first autopsy report, that was just going like, "Wow!" <laughs> and this guy was alive the whole time they were doing it to him. No, oh, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, that's bizarre. Not fun. Not mm -hmm. fun. Not very Christian. That's for sure. Nope. nope. That is something I would not want to check out. Something that I would not want to check out at all. Anyways, getting back to Dogman for a second here. Any updates on the bipedal canines? Any new sightings that you have had reported in? Um, we have two. Um one on the, uh, in the Redding, Pennsylvania area, um, in the Never Sink Mount Penn, Mount Penn Mountains area, that area of that city. And a um, guy coming home from work, and there's a back road. I grew up at the base of that mountain, so I know what he's talking about. There's a back road that comes from Mount Penn to Never Sink Mountain, and um, it Cuts off a lot of traffic, so a lot of people use it, but it's not a very well-maintained road. And he was going home. It just got dark. He just, from his business, took a bank deposit and dropped that off. And this thing crossed the road right in front of him. And he came to my house here and was telling me about it. And because he only lived up the road about 10 miles. Hmm. And I said, if I, show you, if I showed you a drawing... Could you describe to me before I show you the drawing? He said, sure. So he starts describing it. And I turned the drawing around and handed it to him, and he went, that's it. That's what I saw. Eerie. What are people yeah. feeling when they, it, when they see this thing? Everybody describes it as exactly the same. That's the part that puzzles me. You know, when people are describing a Bigfoot, some will say they're taller, shorter, broad-shouldered, not so broad-shouldered, no neck, with neck. You know, I, there's, there's a different description. It's different here. This thing is described exactly the same every time in every report that we've received. 
No differentiating on size, on look, on mannerisms, nothing. Now, I doubt very much if it's just one. He's sure covering a lot of territory if it is one. No kidding. No kidding. Mm-hmm. Not no you don't differentiate. Think it's multiple creatures. Um, could be, but I don't know. I mean, if the description is always the same, there would, would have to be some be co- correlation. I mean, you'd think there would be some sort of different coloring or or some sort of different uh, size. You know, size. Coloring. Yeah. Everything is exactly the same. That's going to be frustrating. I mean, cool, but frustrating. I mean, even the mannerisms, like it'll come out of the woods or it's watching somebody from the woods or in the woods. It doesn't show any fear. It'll stand its ground. And I don't care if the guy's carrying a bazooka. It doesn't matter to him. It'll just stand his ground. And everybody gets that same feeling. Time to get out of here before I get hurt or this is going to go down real bad real quick. And, um, I mean, we've gotten reports from... Law enforcement, hikers, property owners, it is it is what it is, and unfortunately, we don't know what it is. Um, we've tracked reports of that exact creature back to 1868 in Erie, Pennsylvania, and right. um, so... Is it a relic? Has it been here for a long time? Still here? Going to be here? Long after we're gone? Who knows? No kidding. No kidding. Or is it a skinwalk? Well, we can I'll get protect- into that. We can get into that right after the break, Butch. I'm going to get you to hold on as we are going to step out for our final break of the night. Strange Days with Butch Witkowski happens the final Monday of every month right here on Spaced Out Radio. Butch will return to this show on October 29th, so I hope you will too. He'll bring some wild and crazy, scary stories right before Halloween. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio. More with Butch Witkowski's Strange Days right after this. Are you tired of being blocked, shadow banned, or placed in jail for simply posting your thoughts on social media? Social Media Freedom can take care of that for you. Social Media Freedom is the newest and one of the best free new apps that allows you the freedom to post what you want, when you want. It takes seconds to download from your app store. Come join the tribe at Social Media Freedom. It's time to set yourself free. The first annual Caribou Paracon is happening September 28th to 30th in the 108 Mile Ranch, British Columbia. Brought to you by the Canadian Society of Questers and Spaced Out Radio. Come listen to our featured speaker, Grant Cameron, along with Elizabeth Anglin, Paisley Town, Mike Morin, Eric Cooper, and more. It's a three-day supernatural adventure at the Spruce Hills Resort and Spa. Tickets for the weekend are $150 Canadian. The Caribou Paracon, celebrating everything paranormal. A timepiece is a reflection of who you are. And what better way to show off the real you than with an escape watch? Escape is a lifestyle brand accessorizing your days and nights. Choose to escape and create the life of discovery that you deserve. Dream, play, unite with your own personalized escape watch. Head to escapewatches.com. There is no time like the present to enjoy your escape. Use promo code SMF2017 for your 20% discount today. Looking for a place to advertise at a very reasonable cost? Look no further than Spaced Out Radio. SpacedOutRadio.com has an advertising tab that you can click to check out our daily, weekly, and monthly packages to play on the radio or our website, including social media. From commercial spots to banners, we have it all. Check out our competitive pricing today. Find yourself constantly looking up in the sky, looking for answers? Have you had extraterrestrial contact? Are you an abductee? Looking for answers to your experiences? Hi there, I'm R. Keith Andrews, Spaced Out Radio's resident ET expert. Join me live the first Friday of every month where I take questions from the Spaced Out Radio chat room and help you understand those from the far off world. It's two hours of knowledge every experiencer should listen to. Hope to see you there. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. 
you'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. The Call of the Wild is in Vancouver. The Moose Vancouver is one of the hottest bars and restaurants in the city. Open until 2 a.m. nightly, the Moose will rock you like a hurricane all night long. Great food with everything on the menu at $6.95. Near the corner of Nelson and Granville, get your horns up and come rock with us. The Moose Vancouver, the official rocking bar of Spaced Out Radio. Are you an experiencer? Have you had run-ins with strange creatures you can't explain? ETs, Dogman, Bigfoot, Werewolves? They're enough to scare the daylights out of anyone. Hi there, I'm Butch Witkowski from Your Four Cop. And on the last Monday of every month, you can listen to me and the host, Dave Scott, talk about the weird and the strange being reported on Spaced Out Radio. I'm going to bring my investigations and sources, you bring your experiences, and we'll figure out the rest together. Strange Days on Spaced Out Radio. Come tune us in at spacedoutradio.com. You hear footsteps in the empty room above you. A rocking chair begins rocking by itself. Don't be afraid of the things that go bump in the night. Reach for Spirit Story Box. The iPhone app the Huffington Post UK called the only ghost hunting app you will ever need. Spirit Story Box. The spirits are telling their stories. Are you listening? You know, it's hard being the bad man of ufology, but that's just the way that I like it. This is Chris George Zuger, and I'll be hanging out with Dave Scott and SOR scientist Chris Cogswell for Reality Paranormal, the second Wednesday of every month. And our job is to break it down and come to conclusions as to what is really going on in the supernatural world. I'd love for you to join us and bring your questions for us to investigate right here on Space out radio visit purpleplates.com today for over 40 years the purple energy plates have been delivering amazing results for their many customers inspired by the great genius nikola tesla the harmony healing and energetic effects of the plates have proven over and over to be beneficial and often miraculous to thousands of customers Check their site for daily specials and choose from their many energy products. You won't be sorry. Visit them today at purpleplates.com. When it comes to the news, we look for the stories that the mainstream won't cover. Welcome to Spaced Out Radio's The Encounter. This is news director Everett Thiemer. The Encounter is about the weird and strange stories that occur daily, and we scour the world looking to bring them to you. You can hear me with Dave Scott every Monday through Friday in our Encounter News segment. Read us online at spacedoutradio.com or check us out and give our Facebook page a like at SLR The Encounter. So come give The Encounter a read. From the Mile High State of Colorado, sharing our signal around the world, I invite you to Spaced Out Sundays. Hi, I'm Tessa Nicole Thomas, and I'm closing out the week by taking you on a paranormal journey to the world of the weird. Ghosts, aliens, psychic phenomena, I will hit it all in your questions too. So let us highlight the paranormal for you. So come join me for Spaced Out Sundays starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, 12 a.m. Eastern, only at spacedoutradio.com. The views and opinions expressed by tonight's guest and topic of discussion do not necessarily represent the official policy or position of Spaced Out Radio. Spaced Out Weekend Spaced Out Radio Limited, its hosts, syndicated carriers, or anyone associated with this broadcast. You're listening to Spaced Out Radio with Dave Scott. Follow Dave on Twitter at Spaced Out Radio and hashtag Spaced Out Radio and on Facebook Spaced Out Radio Show. Now, back to the program. Welcome back to the third and final hour of Spaced Out Radio tonight. I am your host, Dave Scott. Great to have you with us. Tomorrow night on the program, we take an interesting turn. David Race will be our guest. He's a paranormal comedian. 
We're going to find out what that's all about starting at 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern at SpacedOutRadio.com. Hello and hi to everyone listening in on the SOR Radio Network and Deep Talk Radio. And don't forget, you can also check out our archives for free at our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Spaced Out Radio. Do me a favor, hit that subscribe button. Bill Cardwell has set the password for tonight in the SOR Space Travelers Club. Synesthete. Synesthete. There it is. Synesthete is your password. Make sure you use it wisely, space travelers, as Bill sets the password each and every night right here on the mighty SOR. Our website is spacedoutradio.com, where we have a plethora of features for you. You can rock out to Bumblefoot, shop at our store, read up on the encounter online, and so much more. We're going to have a brand new store coming up very, very soon. Also, this weekend, September 28th through 30th, Spaced Out Radio and the Canadian Society of Questers are putting on the first annual Caribou Paracon. Grant Cameron, David Weatherly, Ross Allison, and so many more interesting speakers coming up. I highly suggest you go to questers.ca. That's questers.ca. And click on the fall conference. Get your tickets. It's going to be a great weekend indeed. Butch Witkowski is our guest tonight on Spaced Out Radio. He comes in the final Monday of the month for a feature we call Strange Days, talking about everything weird, strange, in the cryptid, UFO, paranormal world. Butch, welcome back. Yes, sir. Glad to be back. I had to have a little bit of a laugh here because Uncle Dale in the chat room, he likes his Chipotle sauce. So I recommended him one that I had and... The poor bugger burnt his tongue and lips on this hot sauce. Oh, boy. Yeah. I've, I've got a brother-in-law that raises, he has been raising hot peppers since he was like 15 years old. He's now in his late 60s. He raises these incredibly hot peppers from all over the world. He gets them shipped in and he raises them and grows them in his yard. And then he has a hyperphonic down in his basement and all that stuff. And he gave me a, I was at his house one time visiting my sister, and he, he showed me his pepper. It looked like it was a pepper from a, like a, a toy set. I mean, it was like not even a half an inch long and maybe eight inch wide, but it looked just like a big pepper, right? And mm-hmm. he was, he says, do you want to taste that? And I went like, I don't think so. I said, anything that small has got to kill you. He says, well, let's put it this way. He says, if I make a pot of stew and he cut just the tip of this thing off, couldn't have been much more than a sliver. He said, that's enough for a two-quart pot of stew. And he said, it'll be hot. And I went like, where'd you get these from? He got them from Vietnam. Well, this Chipotle sauce, it's called Rebel. I recommended it to Uncle Dale. And, you know, he put a little too much on you put a little too much on, and poor Uncle Dale, well, his mu- I think it singed his mustache. It singed oh. its mustache. Oh, my. <laughs> you know, and Dale has one of them really good power mustaches that, you know, real manly mustache, and, you know, it could be like a quarter gone by now. I'm, I'm worried <laughs> about it. I'm worried about it. But I have this same I have this same hot sauce in my fridge because I like the really hot, stupid stuff. You know, the stuff that you feel uh, like three days later. That's the kind of hot sauce I like. I don't know why. I just do. I know a guy that puts hot sauce on his oatmeal. Yeah. And it's I gotta like, be the right meal. I'm going like, you really gonna do that? And he loads it up with this heat. As a matter of fact, the oatmeal is actually red when he's done. I'm like, wow, you're a better man than me, McGee. I'd never do it. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Well, it's one of those things that, you know, sometimes you got to do it. Sometimes you got to do it. You know, you just mm-hmm. have to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't mind. I mean, I like hot stuff, but eh, some of that stuff is like really bad. <laughs> <clears throat> really bad. <laughs> yeah, well, my uh, my listeners are trying to get me to do the one chip challenge again, and that was 1.9 million Scoville units, and you got to wait for five minutes before you're allowed to drink anything. I did that for my birthday show this year, Butch. Oh and, God! And my arms went numb. I had to take my headphones out because my ears were killing me. It hurt. Oh, my. 
it hurt bad. I, I, I can honestly say I've done it. I will never do it again. I braved it. I, I won. I raised my arms in victory, and that's good enough. That is very, very good enough. Hey, I got a couple questions from the audience here for you. And by the way, Sherry, thank you so much for being a first-time listener to Spaced Out Radio and sending me a message saying you're liking the show. Really appreciate that. Always love to hear from brand new listeners on the program. Joe has a question for you. Actually, a couple of Joes have questions. Let's go with old Joe here, even though he has nice hair. He says, are there a lot of missing people reports from Pennsylvania Bigfoot sighting areas? Uh, we documented 29, uh, and that's over a, um, I think it was 90 year period, 29, most chil- most of them were children under the age of 10. Really? And how are they disappearing? Are the reports the same? Are you looking into them, Butch, or are you leaving that to the authorities? Uh, no, they were, they're all be, they were all investigated by authorities, but it's, um, they were either, um, you know, working at, on a farm or delivering something you know, taking something from one farm to another or picking something in the field and they're just gone. Now, again, that could be an, you know, an animal because some of these kids were very small. I, the youngest was like three and, um, just wandered off while he was uh, working in the field, with his mother who was working in the field and um, they, and none of these have ever been found ever are there traits that would lead that it is maybe a a strange creature taking them or are we looking at a serial killer type situation here i think it could be anything from a wolf a uh, coyote a coyote could take a 3 year old in a heartbeat and um, now koi wolves are more recent, so uh, I wouldn't think they'd be involved. But back in those days, you know, you had mountain lions uh, here in the state, which were here. I mean, they, they acknowledge that part, but they say they were run off and shot. The last one was shot in, like, I uh, forget, 1895 or something. But it's, um, yeah, the 29 is the number we came up with. And they were documented 29, yeah. Wow. Wow. That's pretty heavy. Pretty heavy. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get to another question here. Let's get back to the new Joe who is saying, if Dogman is like a skinwalker, could it be able to cover incredible distances quickly in your thoughts? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I once had a guy say to me, he just outrun it. I said, well, you'll die tired. You know, people don't realize how fast animals are. I mean, you know, people look at a bear and they say, well, I'll run him. No, you won't. A bear cover 50 yards in a matter of a few seconds. I mean, so this thing here, when you see how it's built and the stories of skinwalkers crossing whole counties out in the West in a matter of minutes, 15, 20 minutes, they cover a whole county. I mean, that's, they have to be incredibly fast. Have there been skinwalker reports in the Pennsylvania area? Mm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it really brings it down to the bipedal canine is what they're describing. The only one that was a little weird was we had one, and I don't even know where I'm going to put that because he said that you know, it looked to him like it had some clothing on it. And I'm like, okay, well, like, what kind of clothing? Well, it looked like it was wearing pants. Well, that's a description of a werewolf, and werewolf is actually fantasy. Um, Hollywood described, Hollywood brought up werewolf. They made werewolf. But, um, you know, werewolves go back in history before Roman times. Um, Romulus and Remus. I mean, I mean, you can go all through history with with uh, werewolves and and the, the history on werewolves, and you can make a whole show out of that. I mean, that's that's how much information there is on that stuff. But um, I I would say you have 
when I look at reports from all over the place on bipedals, you know, from around the world, you, you'll always have one or two where they're, they're describing more of a Hollywood werewolf than they are describing a bipedal canine. So. Right. So do you think that with this skinwalker activity, do you think that it comes from the ancient First Nations legends that are there, or do you think that it's maybe moved over from the West? I think it's uh, I think it's uh, ancient stories from long ago, and the writings. I mean, you can there are I I don't know I might have half a dozen books on werewolves, and um, and some of those are written back in well the earliest one I have is uh, produced in 1868 and it's an original copy, um, but um, I mean the stories in there, uh, and the guy that's all he researched for. 365 pages uh, with some drawings and stuff like that. So when I look at the the old thing there, I can see the connection with the the more recent bipedal canine sightings. I mean, they look pretty much alike in size and strength and body mass. And the one thing that has always been in every report, even when I look back at the old stuff, you know, back before time, Glowing yellow eyes, and I don't know what that deal is, but every report we have has glowing yellow eyes. And then you look at Dogman reports, and they say glowing red eyes. Uh, Bigfoot reports glowing red eyes, but these are glowing yellow eyes. Eerie. Eerie. Mm. Yes, eerie is right. Why yellow? I mean, we all assume that red is the danger color. Like when I see eyes shine up in this area and I see glowing yellow, I see deer. Um, If you uh, look up, uh, just pull up some pictures of wolves. Uh, They all have yellow eyes. Mm -hmm. Interesting. When you were a police officer, did you investigate any strange calls like this? No, no. Um, no, not one, I, not nothing UFO related or, or anything related to any of that 40 and stuff. Um, uh, I've heard stories after, when, you know, after I, I, I got out of it and, you know, moved on, um, where, um, I, some troopers that I met over time have come forward with stories, of, of things that happened while, you know, they were on patrol. But, um, no, I never did, not personally, but I've heard of and talked to a few officers, quite a few officers, as a matter of fact, where they had sightings of strange things running out of the woods or strange stuff in the sky or, uh, you know, some paranormal type things happening to them. But um, myself, no, I haven't. When you were wearing the badge, did you guys have any sort of protocol for UFOs? No, none whatsoever. Mm-mm. Weird. Yep. I, I, I was talking to an RCMP officer, and this will be part of my speech this weekend at the Caribou Paracon. And I was surprised to know that the RCMP has a full protocol on UFOs. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I. Well, uh, now I know what the military does. The military has all kind of protocols on UFOs, but... Um, no, I, no police officers or police departments that I'm aware of that have that. They, they may, but I, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, up here, uh, I also talked to an RCMP dispatcher who stated that when a UFO call comes in, it actually gets put in the top priority folder that the staff sergeant must immediately deal with. Wow. And all reports must be filed to RCMP headquarters in Ottawa, which is the nation's capital here in Canada, and then they get forwarded to NORAD. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. That is really interesting. Yes. Considering NORAD says there's no such thing. 
Well, they may be coming around to that. But the protocol is, if a UFO is in the air, the call comes in. Let's say you report a call in to the RCMP. They immediately call Ottawa. Ottawa calls NORAD. NORAD, because it's a joint Canada-United States military branch, immediately dispatches the closest two CF-18 Hornets to the area to try and intercept the craft, if it hasn't already dispersed. Wow. Yeah. And if it's on the ground, NORAD will send the Hornets in, and then they will either get the RCMP and or the closest military base to send troops to cordon off the area, much like you would see in close encounters of the third kind. Hmm. Wow. Exactly. Heavy stuff, eh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is. Yeah. So I will be talking about that and because I think it's I think it's a little bit interesting. One of the questions that I've had, you know, on my own here is trying to figure out why so many Canadian experiencers were having American contact, whether it's the CIA, men in black, black helicopters being followed by by blacked out vehicles. You know, it, it just kind of tripped me out. MK Ultra, my labs, so on and so forth. It all just seemed to make me wonder, why is this going on? What's going on? Why is this happening to Canadians? Because knowing the Canadian military, we don't have the resources or the funding for something like that. But you got to remember, too, that for many, many years uh, uh, post-World War II, that the Canadian government and the United States government had a lot of things going on in Canada at different bases that. that nobody were there. True that. People didn't even know those bases existed. And uh, they, they, they did a lot of stuff in Canada, the oh, yeah. U.S. government. Easy to hide, especially up in the, in the Alberta area of Cold Lake. Mm-hmm. Right? So, I I mean, the fact is, though, when you file a report with the RCMP, because I confirmed this with this dispatcher who gave me this information, you got to give your full name, your phone number, your address, potentially email address, and they forward that on, because that's in the report. So that means that any report that comes out of Canada that goes through the RCMP, gets in the hands of the Canadian Joint U.S. authorities in the United States at at Cheyenne Mountain. Mm -hmm. Which means that's why Canadian people are having, and I'm just theorizing here, theorizing with maybe a dash of tinfoil on my head, that that's probably why so many Canadians are having American-type experiences. Right. Hmm. Hmm. What's your thoughts? I was just thinking about that. I, I, I kind of thought that stuff. I, I, I understand NORAD. I mean the the, def, the the North American Defense System, but that they would be working together, or that Canada would be that involved with, or taking seriously UFO reports as serious as you just said. I would think that you know. Usually when you're dealing with government and UFO reports, it's like you get blown off, like, yeah, okay, whatever, buddy. Uh, we'll look into it, and that's where that stops. But evidently, it's uh, still heavier. going on the way it's more. Yeah, much heavier than before. Well, the one thing that, that really struck me about talking to the RCMP dispatcher was when she stated to me that that there is a, a high-priority folder So let's say you call in a break and enter and somebody calls in a UFO at the same time. The UFO gets top priority, according to her. She goes, what's what happens to it after the, I, it goes to the staff sergeant's desk. She goes, I know it goes to Ottawa. She goes, but I could tell you this, every UFO report that comes in, to the RCMP has to be dealt with immediately by the staff sergeant. Drop everything else and deal with it. Top priority. Wow. Hmm. Man, that's amazing. Very intriguing. 
very intriguing. I don't what know do if do? it's the I don't know if it's the old Joe or the new Joe just said that he lives inside a Cheyenne Mountain. Yeah. Okay. Uh, he once reported to MUFON a bright green spherical UFO at mid after midnight. Two days later, his report was missing online. And that's pretty much the way it goes, Joe, with MUFON. That's pretty much why I left. <laughs> hey, what do you think of MUFON's star team? Uh, I was one of the original five members of the star team. Um, I... What it was set up to be and how it was supposed to operate is no longer done that way. I mean, um, the five, first five handpicked were spread out across the U.S. Um, I was on the East Coast. I don't even remember who all was all the way to California, but um, they were supposed to have all the equipment we would ever need <clears throat> already ready to go, all packed up in cases ready to be deployed. And if anything happened, you know, whoever was closest to that would be deployed and the equipment would be there when they got there. And um, then they changed hands with directors, and that was the end of that. And then you had to have a certain amount of experience to become a member of the the, uh, STAR team. But now it's just a matter of you just ask your state director if you can join the STAR team, and they put you on. So... Uh, star team never really turned out to be what it was supposed to be, which was a fast reaction force that could get on scene within a matter of hours. They would fly you out, they would get your equipment to you, and you know you'd be on the scene and doing what you do. But that uh, that never happened. Wow, what do you think of their stories being very highly, almost like top secret within MUFON now? <laughs> um. I don't know. I, you know, they change things. They change things up and down in that outfit on a monthly basis. At one time, the public could view or research UFO reports online. They stopped that. Um, it, I, I mean, it's just they still hold that you. They don't allow their members to. Uh, mix with other groups. I mean, that'll just get your butt fired, but I don't know how you fire a volunteer. I never figured that one out. Um, it's it's just weird. Uh, that, I don't even I don't even think about those uh, that that outfit anymore because so much dumb stuff. I mean, like like Joe said about his report missing. You know, uh, but I found that a number of times in Pennsylvania reports that were missing. And it's pretty much why I left when I found out that was happening. And they, a couple of people I still talk to till today uh, say the same thing still going on. They lose reports or reports go missing. And they're usually really good reports, you know, like good eyewitness, good photographs, whatever. And then they're gone. So I could be passing them on, I guess, to whoever. But I know the FAA still has um, all their reports filed by pilots going to Bigelow Aerospace. <laughs> that still intrigues me. Still intrigues yeah. me. That's weird. That's just strange. I mean, what is what is Bigelow Air? Well, we know what Bigelow is. Bigelow Aerospace, his interest in UFOs is the propulsion system. That's what he's after. And um, I dealt with their investigators one time on a case here in Pennsylvania. And they're nice guys, but, you know, I wouldn't give them any information. My friend, we're down to the final 90 seconds with you tonight. Oh, okay. It has cruised on by. Cruised it on does. by once again. It, we could do a five-hour show and it still feel the same. I know. I know. It's, it gets a little ridiculous how quickly these uh, Strange Days episodes go by. You will be back on the program on Monday, October 29th. Are you going to stir up some scary conjuring stories for us? Oh, I can definitely do that. <laughs> Wonderful. I appreciate that, my friend. I really do, because it's always good. Let people know, Butch, where they can get in touch with you in case they have a report. 
Uh, they can get onto the website, euphoricop.com, U-F-O-R-C-O-P.com, and just go down to where it says Terrestrial Contacts. Click on my name. It'll bring up a page and just fill it out. And uh, if you need a phone call, just leave me your, a good time to call you and a phone number, and I'll get right back to you. Or you can get me on Facebook or Twitter, you know, under Butch Witkowski or under UFO Research Center Pennsylvania or JAR Magazine or uh, UFO Cop itself. So plenty of ways to get me. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate you coming on. Anytime. You know that. Absolutely. We'll talk to you next month. All right. Take care. Take care. Butch Wachowski from UF4 Comp comes in here the final Monday of every month. He'll be back once again on Monday, October 29th. Coming up next, we have The Encounter as we take a look at the weird, the wacky, and the WTF news of the day. It's time once again for the news on this Monday night of Spaced Out Radio as we kick off a brand new week, finding out about the weekend that was and the day that was with the Encounter Online, our great news section where you can find it at spacedoutradio.com. Click on the news banner. And with that, we bring in the president of Team Stump, our news director, Everett Themer. Hey, how are you? Good, good. You're just not going to let that team stump thing go, not are you? Not at all, my friend. Not at all. Why would I? Why would I? You're you're well, the you're you're the champion of the cause. Champion of yeah, the cause. You coined team stump. You created team stump. In fact, I believe that you are team stump. Oh. You should have just seen my eye roll that I gave you. Total eye roll, my friend. You should see the eye roll I give you every time you call me the president. Yeah, I can't though. You're in, you're in Illinois. I'm in British Columbia. It's a little bit hard for me to do that. Hey, yeah, that's true. Butch Wachowski is always an interesting guest, my friend. Always an interesting guest. You know, you never know I, I, what he's investigating or what what's up with that. But he he it, investigates some weird stuff, man. It is always fun when he when he comes comes back, and it's hard to believe he's back already. It seems like he was just here. I know. I mean, I, it's it's a lot of fun when he shows up, and mm-hmm. what he what he had to say early on about new investigators and, and people learning to investigate. I think he said a lot of useful things that there are a lot of people out there that could take some of that advice to heart. I agree. I agree. Hey, I got to give a shout out right now to the Ukrainian watermelon, Ron Maniak. Him and his lovely wife, Katie, are driving out to British Columbia for the first annual Caribou Paracon. They're leaving Saskatchewan tomorrow. So if everybody could just like point their hands up to to Saskatchewan and just wave, Ron will be able to see you because it's so flat up there, over there. So the Ukrainian watermelon and his wife making their way. They will be in town on Thursday. I'm very excited. I just wanted to give a shout out to Ron and your lovely wife. Drive safe. Get here in one piece. Watch out for moose on the highways. Now, Watch out for deer, now, elk. Now, are they driving or are they taking snowmobiles? Because I keep seeing reports of snow in Saskatchewan. And I'm oh. assuming it's probably on, farther north than him. Say Saskatchewan again. Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. What about it? You're like Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. You want my Chicago accent to come through? Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan. Home of the watermelons. It's ridiculous. So I, I go down to grew- uh, so speaking of which, I go down to Washington State. And, you know, I spoke at Eric Cooper's Forest Moon Paracon this past weekend. Great event. That had to be fun. They had about 150 people turn out in the audience, which was fantastic. That's awesome. Yeah, totally. Totally. Anyways, he brings in this DJ to do all the music and intro and everything for us. The guy, his guy's name is Cole. 
And uh, before I get into that, big shout out to Eric Cooper, Izzy Cooper, Corey Rees, and the team of Four Spoon Paracon for a fantastic job. What a great venue. What a great venue. Anyways, so I meet uh, Cole the night before. And I look at Cole's hat, and it's a Saskatchewan Rough Riders hat. You have no idea how I hate the Rough Riders. Hate the Rough Riders, Canadian Football League team. Now, I know there's a lot of people who will roll their eyes at me. What the hell are you cheering on, you know, Rough Riders? Their fans would be the equivalent of, like, the like the Raiders in the NFL. Just nuts. Crazy. Except The Raiders wearing, have fans? Well, instead of wearing body armor to a game... The fans here wear watermelons. Anything green. It's terrible. Terrible. Anyways, they're loyal. So, Ron, drive safe. Drive safe. We want to see you in one piece on Thursday, and uh, we'll we'll have some fun. But, nonetheless, let's get to the news of the day, my friend. Boy, you know, it's been a busy weekend. There have been a lot of things happening. And I don't know if you've noticed lately how much artificial intelligence has kind of creeped into the news here and there in areas you may not expect everything from like medical to, you know, the, the, uh, robotic dolls. It just seems like it's sort of creeping into culture everywhere. Yes. Yes. And I now, have noticed. And now there are a, a there is a team of French op- entrepreneurs who believe that they have created an algorithm that will allow AI to paint in the form of some of the old masters like Rembrandt and, and and paint those styles of photos, taking the human factor out of artwork entirely. And in fact, they, they ran a test and they had this AI algorithm print a painting that they called the... Baron of Bellamy. It's an imaginary baron, and they they had this AI paint the family around him and things like that. And the fo- or the the painting sold at a Christie's auction for ten thousand dollars. How? Somebody bought it. They auctioned it off. I never understand art people, man. Because a lot of this stuff I look at, and I'm thinking, man, that's ugly. And then you see the price tag of like 1.2 million. I don't understand at, it. At $10,000 though, this could potentially be a steal in in 20, 30, 40 years if this is the way of the future. This is legitimately the first painting or piece of artwork. It's not really painted, it's printed on canvas. Mm-hmm. But this is the first artwork that has been produced and sold at auction by artificial intelligence. But either way. And, you know, obviously there are a lot of people sort of against this because art is so, not only is it subjective, but you have the, the input of the artist, how they're feeling when they're painting and things like that. And this has in taking that out entirely, and essentially what this algorithm does is it, it scans and analyzes thousands of paintings. And then it will print or, or, or paint or design, however you want to phrase it, its interpretation of these paintings. And the one that it did, it, it's kind of in the style of a Rembrandt. But it's it's fuzzy. It's not as clear as you would expect a a painting by Rembrandt to be. I don't know if you've ever seen one or looked at one really up close. But when you look at the detail, it, it's hard to believe that they can take a brush and make it look as detailed as it is. This isn't quite that way, but it is the first step. And this algorithm has made more printing art than I have ever doing art. I don't know if I would buy AI art. I really don't. I think why not? It doesn't interest me. I I mean, you know, for about 
$9,700 less, you could probably go to Ikea and get a nicer piece of art. And, you know, that that's kind of the funny thing, because if you go to any of the discount stores or department stores, nowadays you can go and find pictures that are well beyond what we would consider posters or prints. You can get something very similar to this, which is essentially a, a picture printed on a canvas-like material that I imagine would be very similar to this and would look very much like a painting. I get that. I get that. You know, and obviously it's reprints of of things actual people have painted. But at the same time, we keep talking about how artificial intelligence is developing the capabilities or we expect it to have the capabilities to learn, to to analyze things and, and interpret and, and grow. Why wouldn't the next step be artificial intelligence relaxing, doing a little painting? Well, I get that, but I mean, art's supposed to tell a story. It's like music or poetry. It's supposed to tell a story. There's nothing that that is a, a story that AI could tell. There's no story there. This is true. I, can, can you imagine, though, if it analyzes and scans these photos and then it just randomly generates its own photos, isn't there some form of intelligence, conception, idea behind that photo or, or that picture? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't feel it. I don't feel it. I mean, I'm, I'm not I mean, sure granted, I do. Granted that, I mean, I uh, what do I know about art? You know, the only thing I want to buy in art is I want to get one of those original Bob Rosses. Remember the joys of painting on PBS? Oh, I, I want, I one, want of one of those. Yeah. Put a little bird over here. That's Happy okay. little cloud. Smack the devil out of his brush when he's drying it off. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine what Bob Ross is thinking about some of this stuff? Oh, he's probably hating it. Probably hating it. He's probably hating it. You know? Well. You know, some of his about, paintings, I I uh, went on eBay to look at one of Bob Ross's paintings. They, if you get one of the originals that was on the television show, that he painted on the show, those are going for like anywhere between like $9,000 and $80,000. So this AI one would still be in the price range, if not significantly cheaper. Don't care. Not buying it. Not no, buying there, it. there is something, there is something to be said about the fact that there is no human emotions or anything put into the painting, I think. But, you know, it is, it is another step for artificial intelligence. I get you. Scary times, my friend. I don't like that AI stuff. <laughs> I do not like that AI stuff. You know what I don't like more is fraudulent psychics. Yes, I heard about this one. I and mean, we, we talked. We have. We talked the other day. Uh, was it Thursday? About that one psychic in Alberta that had kind of defrauded yes. a, a, a family. Well, now there's another one who's, who's going to be sentenced. And this woman has all the earmarks of some form of scam artist. Right. Her name is G Gina Marie Marks. Right. But as a psychic, she gives her readings and provides her services as Natalie Miller, which right there to me, that should be, a a a big red flag if she's not using her real name but she uh was convicted in february of defrauding some clients and she has to pay restitution good and i it, the restitution is right up there around $340,000 wow I'm sure she doesn't have that. She's going to have to up her rates on her readings. How did she defraud these people, Everett? 
she uh i'm sorry i was just moving something around here she okay. basically you know would take their money she did not prov- again she did not provide readings but what she would do is she would get like their credit card numbers and credit cards and go on shopping sprees and she would post photos of her shopping sprees online as she was doing them and one customer got suspicious and asked for her money back and she you know went through the typical channels of trying to get it back and was denied so she she called the police and actually hired a private investigator and you know again she was repeatedly denied and she had paid i believe it was about twenty seven hundred dollars and she never got it back but her private investigator was able to catch and apprehend this miss marks as she was attempting to flee the country of course you know, and, and why not run? I, ironically, after she pled guilty, she originally pled guilty in February and the sentencing is coming up, but she made a statement where she said, she's not a monster. She's a good person. Um, oh, of course she is just bilking innocent people who, who go during a trying time in their life to her. Yeah. She, of course she's a good person. Well, well she made the comment that, People are racist against gypsies. She oh, is a gypsy. Here we, go. here we go. The racism card. Yes. You know, they're racist. And she claimed that as a gypsy, they have powers and they're not allowed to talk about it. Oh. You know, the sad thing is that I think, you know, after the fact, we can sit here and look at the case and go, oh, somebody should have noticed this. Somebody should have seen this. But. When you're going through it, when you first meet one of these people or you begin this process or you search out a psychic, maybe you're not looking for the signs, but also you don't have all the signs right in front of you. I mean, I'm sure most of these people did not realize that she was using a fake name. I'm sure most of these people didn't expect to be defrauded. No, I I think it would be safe to say none of them expected to be defrauded. But at the same time, I think some people are so hoping to get the answers that they kind of avoid the red flags that they they could potentially see. Well, nobody wants to see it. Nobody wants to 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 be taken advantage of. Nobody wants to admit it. But this is another case. I mean, I this is you. this is bad for the psychics. We we need to start seeing some of the the good ones out there start to stand up against some of these people and, and start to weed out their weed out the bad ones, or at least call them on the carpet beyond you know before things like this happen. Hmm. This one's just going to piss me off because I hate people taking advantage. And, you know, there are, you know, whether you believe in psychics or not, we've had some very intelligent, intuitive people on this show before. And, you know, we try and weed out the bad ones or who we perceive to be the less intuitive, but more showboat type intuitives. And I can tell you, there are people who I trust that, that read me very, very well. And some of them do it professionally. Some do it as a hobby or as a gift. You have to be careful and don't get swindled. That's the hard part. That is. And I think some of that though, has to do with the fact that maybe not everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who can refer a reliable psychic. So you, you look for one and you're, you're kind of left out there to hang and hope that you get a good one. Oh, I know. I know. Ask around. If you feel you need a reading or you need some intuitive help, there are good ones out there. Do your research. Do your research. Exactly. we move on to the next one, my friend. You ever get in a fight over a song? Have you, have you really been? No. It really well, well uh, hold on i'm not going to say that i i get tortured i used to get tortured at my previous work 
by Joni Mitchell's Big Yellow Taxi. I hate that song. There aren't many songs in this world that I hate, but that would be number one on the list with with Karma Chameleon by the Culture Club being number two. I hate those songs. Hate them. Loathe them. Loathe. How can you how can you hate Karma Chameleon? It's a terrible song. I mean, if you want to go eighties, give me a little Tapau, Heart and Soul, Bonnie Tyler, Total Eclipse of the Heart, or the Bangles, Walk Like an Egyptian, even Depeche Mode's Personal Jesus. But Culture Club is terrible. They're terrible. Oh, I haven't thought about the Bangles in like, well, about three hours. How can you not think of Susanna Hoffs? How about we think about Bruno Mars? Okay. Why would anybody fight over Bruno Mars? Well, these two lifelong friends, they were friends apparently for over 50 years, which right there means they're over the age of, what, 20? So they should not be listening to Bruno Mars to begin with. That's Absolutely way out of not. their age. They should be into still listening to the classics like Skinner. But somehow they got into an argument over whether or not a song was written and performed by, by Bruno Mars. And it ended up with one of them pistol whipping and accidentally discharging a gun against the other. Of course. <sighs> I mean, I, right there. Who is going to pistol whip somebody over whether or not a song was written or performed by Bruno Mars? First off, if, if your biggest thought in life is to pull a gun on someone for arguing about Bruno Mars, you have some psychological problems. Was there alcohol or hardcore drugs outside of marijuana used during this? There there doesn't seem, there doesn't seem to be any reference to either, but uh, this, this gentleman, Roger Washburn has been charged with battery. Good. The, the the person that his friend has remained anonymous, but this, I mean, if, if they've been friends for 50 years, we have to assume that they're between 55 and, or, and older. How immature do you have to be to pistol whip somebody who it's safe to say is probably one of your best friends over a song? Whether, you know, who really, ultimately, who cares? It's Bruno Mars. Nobody, especially two grown men, should be fighting over Bruno Mars. Honestly. I, I, I'm going to go with what you said there in the beginning. Nobody should be fighting over Bruno Mars. It, yeah. It's... No. It, and to take it to such an extreme... Of, of pistol whipping. I, I mean, hear that's, you. That's some anger issues. There is definite anger issues there. Definite <laughs> anger issues. I'm almost embarrassed for them. They need to turn in their man cards immediately. I'm immediately. sad this didn't happen in Florida. Indiana's a little close to me. Hmm. And, you know, Indiana is the home for a lot of good rock and roll musicians. Especially the greatest, Axl Rose. DJ Ashba, also from Indiana. Lots of good musicians from Indiana, and these two morons are, are pull, <laughs> one guy's pistol whipping his buddy over a Bruno Mars song. How <laughs> wrong is society right now? There may be a lot of reasons to pistol whip somebody, but that's not one of them. No, no, not at all. I think we got to get to the thought of the Dave. That's way too frustrating. My goodness. How do you pistol whip somebody over a Bruno Mars song? Hey, Bestie and Twerk were added to the Scrabble Dictionary. Terrible. Terrible. The thought of the Dave happens every night at this time where we ask a question on our Facebook and Twitter pages. And then we read your responses on the air. Why? Because we love the honest answers that you give all of us as listeners to this show. 
So today's thought of the day is as followed. How many species of aliens have you had contact with and which ones? Well, let's read. Coral, none, except for the kitties dressed up for Halloween. Oh, that's a cute comment. My little guy's going as uh, Bumblebee. He's pretty excited. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, Grandma and Grandpa went and bought him his costume without me knowing. But that's okay. That's what he wanted to be anyways, and that's what I would have got him. So no big deal there. All right. Wyatt, my ex-wife was an alien. Don't know the planet she came from, but it was definitely way out there. Oh, my (laughs) goodness. Natasha, you're the only one, Dave. The only one. Ad Gnome sends me a gnome of an alien. Thank you. Appreciate that. Like I need more gnomes in my life. Robert, well, since there was only one species in every alien movie, I'm still stuck on one, although maybe two if you count the Predator movies. That's kind of cool. Kevin. Zeta, tall, white, reptilian, alpha, draconian, and another reptilian female unknown type. And Sasquatch. He's been busy. Busy! Sylvia, most humans, they are getting weirder and weirder. (laughs) That might be the comment of the night. Right there. Shar, the only aliens I see in my neighborhood are pretending to be humans. Only God knows what they really are. Author Bobby Richardson from Australia. When asking for the truth of humanity, I've had visits and seen for real Anunnaki, Pleiadians, Lyrans, and Reptilians, plus Greys with my daughter. That would be kind of cool. It's cool when you see them face to face. Because you're like, hey, Milton, where's Carl? I don't know. Kelly, when I am in Florida, well, I am in Florida for the time being, so really the only aliens I have come in contact with are the snowbirds that come down from Canada. Oh, really? Went there. Bob, hundreds. You could see them daily if you go to Walmart. Just saying. (laughs) (laughs) Hi, Bob. Love you, bro. Susan, I believe I had contact with two greys. When I was five years old, they talked about my starting school and how I should try to do my best. Well, then see, the grays aren't so bad. The grays aren't so bad. Telling Susan to be good in school. We got time for a couple more. Chad, zero, but been into it since I've had some strange things and saw some things when I was in Iraq. Uncle Dale gets the final say of the night. Because of his power stash, and I feel bad about the hot sauce that I told him to get. Well, there was the angel who handed me the yogurt to put out the inferno caused by the rebel Chipotle smoking hot sauce. That's my fault. (laughs) My fault. I feel bad over that. Everett, where can we find the encounter? You can find the encounter at uh, spacedoutradio.com under the news tab, or you can find it at facebook.com forward slash SOR the encounter online. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, my friend. We'll talk to you tomorrow night. Excellent. All right. Mr. Everett Themer, president of Team Stump, right there. I know he's rolling his eyes over that one. Big thanks to Butch Witkowski. Strange Days. Butch will be back on October 29th for his next appearance. Tomorrow night on the show, comedian and now paranormal enthusiast David Race is going to join us. How do you go from comedian to chasing Bigfoot? We'll find out. 9 p.m. Pacific, midnight Eastern at SpacedOutRadio.com. Don't forget, this is your last, one of your last chances to get tickets for the first annual Caribou Paracon. Go to Questers.ca. That's Questers.ca in order to get your tickets right now. It's this weekend. We want to see you there. We got Mr. Ron Bumblefoot Thal rocking in the background with Little Brother is watching. Bumblefoot is the official music of Spaced Out Radio, rocking us in and out of every single show. Get your horns up for the guitar god himself. Special thanks to everybody listening in at home, in your cars, at work, wherever you may be. Special thanks to everybody in the chat rooms in Revolution Radio on Spreaker, the SOR Space Travelers Club, and at hashtag Spaced Out Radio on Twitter. Thanks for sharing the show. 
show, telling your friends all about us. Because together, my friends, we own the night. I will talk to you in 21 hours from now. Mr. Bumblefoot, we need a favor. We need you to take us home. Have a good night, everyone. See you tomorrow. Good night.